So hello everyone, bonjour. Um, Julia Eiler Smith, I work at the LN Art Gallery. Mon nom est Julia Eiler Smith, j'habite, euh, je travaille à la galerie Léonard Ibn Eilen. Et bienvenue à l'événement euh, Hotel Atlas, collection de récits et de fragments, lecture performative organisée par l'artiste Kim Kilhoffner. Hotel Atlas, collected stories and fragments, live reading performance organized by artist Kim Kilhoffner. Um, J'aimerais commencer par reconnaître que l'Université Concordia est située en territoire autochtone, lequel n'a jamais été cédé. Je reconnais la nation Ghania Gahaga comme gardienne des terres et des eaux sur lesquelles nous nous réunissons aujourd'hui. Jojage, Montréal, est historiquement connu comme un lieu de rassemblement pour de nombreuses Premières Nations, et aujourd'hui, une population autochtone diversifiée ainsi que d'autres peuples y résident. C'est dans le respect des liens avec le passé, le présent et l'avenir que nous reconnaissons les relations continue entre les peuples autochtones et autres personnes de la communauté montréalaise. Alors, je vais passer la parole. I will pass on to Kim Kilhoffner. Hi, I'm Kim Kilhoffner. Thank you all for being here and for uh, taking the time to read the texts and engage with them and just read them for this event because I'm a very shy person and I, I would be very like shy to do this so like thank you for uh, doing this for me in a way. Um, okay, read the... I would like to begin by acknowledging that Concordia University is located on unceded indigenous lands. The Ganogehaga Nation is recognized as the custodians of the lands and waters on which we gather today. Uh, Jojalge, Montreal is historically known as a gathering place for many First Nations. Today, it is home to a diverse population of indigenous and other peoples. We respect the continued connections with the past, present, and future in our ongoing relationships with indigenous and other peoples within the Montreal community. And we'll begin, oh, we'll begin with um, Jessica Benvenides. I'm Jessica Benavides. I will be reading Yokiku Motoya. This is Fitting Room. She'd gone in, so there was no way she wasn't coming out again. The only things in there were a rug and a mirror but the customer had already been in the fitting room for three hours. What was she doing in there? Trying on our clothes, of course, nonstop since mid-afternoon. Whenever I asked her, how are you doing in there, madam? She'd reply, I'm just getting changed. When a customer says this, you really have to wait a while before asking again. Because if you do, and they have to say, I'm just getting changed again, that would feel pretty awkward. And if you'd been trying to rush them, Plus, they'd be insinuating that they were doing things at their own pace and wanted you to leave them alone. In terms of a reason a customer might not come out of the fitting room, one possibility is that they've actually finished changing, but the clothes are hopelessly unsuitable. It's happened to me too. There are some clothes in the world that the moment you put them on make you feel so miserable you just want to smash the mirror in front of you as your reflection looks on in surprise. The kind of clothes that make you think, you've got to be kidding and wonder if perhaps you've always looked like a clown, whether your entire life until, up until that point had, has been an embarrassing mistake. At first I thought, that must be it. The shop where I work mainly sells slightly quirky pieces from high fashion labels that the owner purchases overseas. So it's not uncommon for the customer to try something on, but then feel hesitant about coming out of the booth to look at herself in the large mirror. Our clothes are by no means inexpensive either, so when that happens, we tend to leave the customer be and give her plenty of time to make up her mind in private. So I was ringing up other customers and organizing the stock room and generally trying to fill some time before checking up on the customer again. When I couldn't wait any longer, I called through the curtain. Is there anything I can help you with at all? There's nothing, I'm fine, said the customer, sounding a little annoyed. But haven't you got a dress that's more casual than this one? This one is too much of a party dress. I couldn't just wear it anywhere. In that case, I said, and brought her a light silk dress with a subtle, almost translucent print. This one's from a Paris label. They do a lot of printed styles, lovely, sophisticated colors. The customer reached a hand out from behind the curtain and grabbed the clothes hanger, 
pulling the dress into the fitting room. There was a lengthy rustle, rustling as she got changed. I wondered whether I should go do something else, but I decided to wait. Store policy is that the same member of staff stays with the customer for the duration of their visit. Many of our clothes can be somewhat challenging to work into a look, so we pride ourselves on helping customers find the style that works best for them. To do this, you really have to start by knowing what your customer is like. What age are they? How tall? What about their personality? As it was, this customer had just come in as I was serving one of our regulars a cup of English tea. So all I'd seen was her hand as she pulled the curtain closed, saying, I'm trying this on. What sort of size would you normally take in a dress, madam? I forget, hard to keep track. Perhaps she was extremely shy and it had taken all of her courage to come into our boutique after seeing us featured in some magazine. And maybe she still couldn't bear to, for us to see her because of her insecurities about her height or weight and had missed her opportunity to safely leave the booth. Do you tend to choose a trouser look, ma'am? Or would you often wear a skirt? Sometimes I more often wear a skirt and sometimes I tend towards a trouser. Another possibility was that she'd recently had plastic surgery and her face had collapsed while she was getting changed. She might be desperately adjusting silicone at this very moment. When I was younger, I heard about a woman who disappeared from a fitting room while on, while on vacation overseas. There was a trap door in the floor of the booth and she'd been sold straight to people smugglers. Maybe I could scare my customer into leaving the fitting room by telling her that story. That might actually be more good customer service, less likely to cause offense than saying, please do feel free to step out and look into this larger mirror out here. Are you on your way home from work today? Does that have anything to do with finding something to wear? Or what if it was a woman who'd once been humiliated in a fitting room, trying to take revenge on retail staff by haunting us? I nearly freeze whenever I'm walking down a street at night and hear the sound of high heels behind me. It must be the guilt from constantly telling customers, lovely, or that suits you so well, regardless of what they're trying on. She was still in there at 8 p.m., closing time. I checked in with her several times to no avail. I could hardly draw the curtains uh, myself, so I had no choice but to say, there's no rush, madam, and settle in. The customer kept making rustling sounds inside the booth, and once in a while I heard her murmur, oh my, or mm-hmm. She requested each piece in every size and color, one after the other. Barreling around our storeroom to gather all the items she asked for, I wondered what her story was, what important occasion she might be shopping for with such thoroughness. I asked my manager for the keys to the store. I'd made up my mind to stay after everyone else went home to help my customer find what she was looking for. Our regulars could count on their favorite member of staff to be at the service at any time with just a phone call. So we often stayed open after hours for a single customer. By the time the clock rounded midnight, my customer had finished trying on every piece of clothing in the shop. Which would she choose? I made a cup of tea and set it by the sofas for when she finally emerged. But it wasn't to be. She didn't come out of the fitting room dressed in the clothes she'd arrived in. Instead, she called out that she wanted to go back to the very first thing she tried on. This, oh, sorry. Then she wanted to do the same with every single piece in the shop. My stamina finally gave out around 3 a.m. In, in the morning, I woke up on the shop sofa. The customer was still in the fitting room. She'd been trying to find something to wear all night. Poor awkward lamb. I was starting to have a soft spot for her. I decided to run out to a local bakery that opened at 6 and place the bagel and the cafe au lait I bought just outside the curtain saying, please help yourself. She didn't respond, but the paper bag was gone when I next looked. I touched up my makeup and changed into some spare clothes I had in my locker before the other staff arrived. It's not your same customer from yesterday, is it? They asked, surprised, but thankfully, when I said, I know, she asked me to open up first thing. They didn't probe any further. By mid-afternoon, she'd complete she completed her second try-on of all the clothes I brought from out of stock. Still, she wasn't satisfied. I drove to the nearest fast fashion outlet and purchased dozens of pieces for her. Some other customers came to our boutique, but I left them to my colleagues to serve. There were two other fitting rooms, so no one seemed to notice my peculiar customer. She didn't like any of the clothes I bought for her either. So finally, I decided to take her to another clothes shop, fitting room and all. 
I just remembered that our owner liked to change the decor of the boutique every once in a while, so our fitting rooms were movable, on wheels. Tell everyone I'll be out for a bit, I said to one of the other girls, and hooked the rope around my shoulders. It was heavy, but not impossible to pull forward. I headed into town, towing the fitting room. Pulling a thing like this in broad daily daylight, I'd been prepared for people to stare, but no one seemed to give it a second glance. I guess they thought we were setting up for some event or doing a photo shoot. My customer inside the booth, who'd been so hard to please, seemed to be having misgivings, saying, there's no need for you to go to so much trouble. Please, don't be silly, we've come so far. We're going to find the perfect thing for you, I promise. I said, trying to keep her spirits up. I want you to come out of that fitting room with a smile on your face. I was set on finding my customers something really special. I thought I'd take her to my favorite boutique. That meant navigating a serious hill through steep residential streets. I called on passerbys for help. What's behind the curtain, they wanted to know. When I said, a valued customer, someone said, that's a funny way of getting publicity. But several of them offered to help push to the top of the hill anyway. Together, we transported the fitting room. The steeper the incline got, the more the curtain swayed, and I gradually was able to make out the shape of my customer inside. No one else seemed to be looking, but I couldn't see, but I could see she wasn't fat at all. She was smallish, but not especially tiny. More to the point, she didn't really seem human. Draped in the curtain, she was an unusual shape that I'd never seen before. From time to time, I could hear a sticky, slurping, roiling kind of sound, and then the curtain would bulge and cave in different places. I had no idea what she was at all, but it was really no wonder she couldn't find an outfit that suited her when her body type was so unique. I was just catching my breath, having towed the fitting room to the top of the hill. All that remained was to descend the hill on the other side. When the rope slipped from my hands and the fitting room started to roll down the steep street, casters rattling, I'd used up all my strength and didn't have the energy to run after it. The fitting room hurtled to, down towards the bottom of the hill at an incredible speed, growing smaller and smaller. Madam, I cried, loud as I could. You're welcome to take that curtain if you'd like. A hand stuck out from between the curtains and waved slowly at me for a long time, like someone saying goodbye from a departing car window. Then the hand threw something into the road. When I ran to pick it up, I saw it was a banknote in a currency I didn't recognize. Since then, I've taken to imagining all sorts of things about the things I see as I walk down the street. Anything at all could turn out to be something beyond my wildest dreams. My customer's physique was kind of runny and grotesque, but depending how you looked at it, you could also call it elegant. Picture a picnic blanket laid on a meadow. I bet that would look pretty good on her, like a floral print dress. Was ist ein Ensemble? Von Anna Oppermann. Ensemble nenne ich die Dokumentation einer bestimmten Methode des Vorgehens bei Wahrnehmungs- und oder Erkenntnisübungen. Ein Ensembleaufbau ist die Präsentation, äh, Präsentation vieler Bemühungen darum, ein Stück Realität zu erkennen, zu beurteilen oder auch ein Problem in den Griff, Begriff zu bekommen. Die Dokumentation ist eine Visualisierung, Spürensicherung und Erinnerungshilfe psychische Prozesse verschiedener Bewusstseinebenen, verschiedene Bezugssysteme und als solcher immer auch Untersuchungsgrundlage und Zulänglichkeiten fixieren und bewusst machen im Hinblick auf mögliche Korrekturen und Modifikationen, was eine relative Offenheit des Arrangements bedenkt wissen wollen, wie, warum ich, die anderen, die Umstände, die Zustände so sind. Wie weit sind wir, wenn ich fremdbestimmt und bewusst manipuliert, zum Beispiel auch bei der Herstellung von Kunst, wie entsteht Meinung, Meinung über Kunst und so weiter. Dabei wird von einem Punkt ausgehend, vom relativ einfachen zum relativ komplizierten, der Radius der Interessenkreise immer größer. Zur Methode. Ausgehend von einem realen Objekt. Am Anfang ein Fundstück aus der Natur, zum Beispiel ein Laublatt. Später Menschen, Begebenheiten, Äußerungen, 
andere und so weiter entwickeln sich oder werden stimuliert folgende Zustandphasen. 1. Meditation. 2. Katharsis. Das meint hier ein möglichst spontanes, zum Teil automatisches, auch subjektives Reagieren und Abreagieren und Assoziieren auf das Objekt, um unbeziehungsweise vorbewusst Äußerungen zu provozieren und sie, soweit es möglich ist, zu fixieren in Form von Skizzen und Notizen. Video- oder Tonbahnaufnahmen wären möglich. Dies ist eine Phase polyphoner Ausdehnung, in der alles zugelassen ist. Auch Darstellungen, die gemessen mit gängigen Bewertungskriterien unter den Tisch fallen müssten. Depersonalisation, Projektion, Dissoziation und so weiter. Das Chaos muss ausgehalten werden. Ergebnisse dieser Phase werden in öffentlich präsentierten Ensembles nur auszugsweise zugänglich gemacht, da in ihr zwangsläufig die meistens persönlichen Unzulänglichkeiten und dummdreisten Bemerkungen zum Vorschein kommen. 3. Reflexion, Feedback Zusammenfassende Zeichnungen und Zustandsfotos, um eine Distanz zu provozieren im verbalen Bereich, Erste individuelle Deutungen und Assoziationen im Hinblick auf mögliche Ursachen, Motivationen, Sammlung von Zitaten anderer. 4. Analyse im Versuch der Herstellung eines Gesamtbezugs. Details und Zwischenergebnisse in Gruppen zusammenstellen, konfrontieren und vergleichen mit verschiedenen Bezugssystemen, Bewertungsräumen interdisziplinär mit Texten aus dem Bereich der Psychologie, Philosophie, Soziologie und so weiter. Formulierung eines ensemblespezifischen Themas, das die Richtung des entzukreisenden Problems angibt und Diagramme, welche die Methode komprimieren. Im visuellen Bereich, hier vorheben durch Vergrößerungen, großformatige Fotoleinwände, Bilder, und Abstraktion durch Zusammenfassungen, Verkleinerungen im, Foto, in, im Zustand Fotos, welche viel Details für Ausstehende nicht mehr erkennbar bzw. Nachvollbar, nachvollziehbar macht. Betont werden muss, Polyphones aus denen wechselt ab mit Zusammenfassungen. Die Zeit spielt eine besondere Rolle, insbesondere auch bei der notwendigen Gewinnung von Distanz. Und so erstreckt sich die Entstehung und Modifikation vieler Ensembles über mehrere Jahre. Ist theoretisch nie abgeschlossen. Durch den Gebrauch verschiedener Medien, Foto, Zeichnung, Arrangement in Raum, Umgangssprache, intellektuellen Sprache und so weiter, und durch die Gegenüberstellung von spontan Reflexions-, Realitäts- und Abstraktionsebene sind Metaebene Äußerungen möglich. Ein, zusammenfassend, ein zusammenfassendes Foto eines Ensembleaufbaus ist als sogenanntes Bezugsfoto zusammen mit dem realen Objekt Ausgang weiterer Bemühungen in Anwendungen der oben angedeuteten Methode. Okay, next we have Cassandra Sarah Pegg. So this is four poems by Marianne Moore. The first one is called Roses Only. You do not seem to realize that beauty is a liability rather than an asset. That in view of the fact that spirit creates form, we are justified in supposing that you must have brains. For you, a symbol of the unit, stiff and sharp, conscious of surpassing by dint of native superiority and liking for everything self-dependent 
anything an ambitious civilization might produce. For you, unaided to at attempt through sheer reserve to commute presumptions resulting from observation is idle. You cannot make us think you a delightful happen so. But Rose, if you are brilliant, it is not because your petals are the without which nothing of preeminence. You would look, minus thorns, like a what is this, a mere peculiarity. They are not proof against a storm, the elements, or mildew, but what about the predatory hand? What is brilliance without coordination? Guarding the infinitesimal pieces of your mind, compelling audience to the remark that it is better to be forgotten than to be remembered too violently. Your thorns are the best part of you. And this one is called Poetry. I too dislike it. There are things that are important beyond all this fiddle. Reading it, however, with a perfect contempt for it, one discovers in it, after all, a place for the genuine. Hands that can grasp, eyes that can dilate, hair that can rise, if it must. These things are important, not because a high-sounding interpretation can be put upon them, but because they are useful. When they become so derivative as to become unintelligible, the same thing may be said for all of us, that we do not admire what we cannot understand. The bat holding on upside down or in quest of something to eat, elephants pushing, a wild horse taking a roll, a tireless wolf under a tree, the immovable critic twitching his skin like a horse that feels a flea, the baseball fan, the statistician. Nor is it valid to discriminate against business documents and school books, all of these phenomena are important. One must make a distinction, however. When dragged into prominence by half-poets, the result is not poetry. Nor till the poets among us can be literalists of the imagination, above insolence and triviality, and can present, for inspection, imaginary gardens with real toads in them, shall we have it. In the meantime, if you demand, on the one hand, the raw material of poetry in all its rawness, and that which is, on the other hand, genuine, then you are interested in poetry. This one is Injudicious Gardening. If yellow betokens infidelity, I am an infidel. I could not bear a yellow rose ill will because books said that yellow boded ill. White promised well. However, your particular possession the sense of privacy in what you did deflects from your estate, offending eyes, and will not tolerate effrontery. And the last one by Marianne Moore is When I Buy Pictures. When I buy pictures, or what is closer to the truth, when I look at that of which I may regard myself as the imaginary possessor, I fix upon what would give me pleasure in my average moments, the satire upon, upon curiosity in which no more is discernible than the intensity of the mood, or, quite the opposite, the old thing, the medieval decorated hat box, in which there are hounds with waists diminishing like the waist of the hourglass, and deer and birds and seated people, it may be no more than a square of parquetry. The literal biography, perhaps, in letters standing well apart upon a parchment-like expanse, an artichoke in six varieties of blue, the snipe-legged hieroglyphic in three parts, the silver fence protecting Adam's grave, or Michael taking Adam by the wrist. Too stern an intellectual emphasis upon this quality or that detracts from one's enjoyment. It, mu it must not wish to disarm anything, nor may the approved triumph easily be honored. That which is great because something else is small. It comes to this, of whatever sort it is, it must be lit with piercing glances into the life of things. It must acknowledge the spiritual forces which have made it. Thank you. And this is a very short one by Ingeberg Bachmann called Shadow, Roses, Shadow. Under an alien sky, shadows, roses, shadow. On an alien earth, between roses and shadows, in alien waters, my shadow. Thank you. Uh, next we have uh, Lulu Gekiero.
Hello. <laughs> I will begin by reading Next Year or I Fly My Rounds, Tempestuous, by Laurie Niedeker, January 1935. Wade all life backwards to its source, source which runs too far ahead. The satisfactory emphasis is on revolving. Don't send steadily. After you know me, I'll be no one. To give heat is within the control of every human being. February. If you circle the habit of your meaning, it's fact and no harm done. Layman, due to the stars, around 1910, an erudition even sat backwards on diaphragms, kept for the females so long without flowers. March. You will arrange to better me when the pastry comes and cherries are such double days. Her understanding of him is more touching than intelligent. He holds her knees without her knowing how she's boned. April. I can always go back to fertilization, kimonos, wraparounds, and diatribes. For so long, one has seen nothing to be really anxious about. It's always just a flower in the buttonhole, but insipid connections counting for a day. Tomorrow is the fairest. May. Don't worry about the comma, darling. Nobody ekes out a more facile distend bathroom luxury. Dolly's archaeological reminiscence of Millet Anglis strike a thrall, bring an ear drum up to a laughing order at spittle point for tipped orals and aluminum casticulars. June. The trouble is this. This stirs a real meaning. Humanity is engaged on equal burial. Now I will continue on to the next text. Thank you very much. I will be reading Ingeborg Bachmann in an excerpt from Von einem Land, einem Fluss und den Seen. Von einem, der das Fürchten lernen wollte und Wortgang aus dem Land von Fluss und Seen, sah ich die Spüren und des Atems Wolken, denn, so Gott will, wird sie der Wind werfen. Saal und Halt ein, sie werden vielen gleichen. Die Lose enthält sich die Odysseen, doch er erfüllt, dass wo sie Lärme wieden, schon Wölfe mit dem fixen Blichen stehen. Er fühlte seine Welle ausgeschrieben. Er sie ihn wegtrug und ihm leid geschah. Sie sprang im See auf die Schwang der Wiege und die sein Sternbild durch die Schlier sah. Er schüttelte und dreht die trauben Nüsse. Den Himmel schlug er scharfe Tonne war, und Sonntag war im Meer aus Glocken süße. Sonntag war jeder Tag, denn er verlor. Er sorgt der Kehren aus verweichen Gleisen, von keinem leichten Rädergang verführt. Beim Ausschrei, denn die Wasser weit gerichten, an Seen von einer Steinschlag aufgeführt. Doch sieben Steine werden sieben Brotte. 
als er im Zwickel in die Nacht entwich, er trachte durch den Duft und streute Kummern im Gel für der Verloren hinter sich. Erinnere dich, du weißt jetzt alle Landen, wer treu ist, wird im Frühlicht heimgeführt, o oh, seid gestundet, seid uns überlassen. Was ich vergaß, hat glitzend mich berührt. Next we have Bridget Ha. I'll be reading from Debbie and Epic by Lisa Robertson. She has smoothed her pants to no end. This is the light Debbie steps into. Her toffeed flanks roll with greatness and sustenance in their sockets, and her hearty hands bear the bruised sea. Mighty, amazing beauty moves her, and all the whirling majorettes are her marvelous squadron. Their bare throats spill analysis. Dactylic eastern desks pom-pom from puddles of yellow mud. Her rudders bathed in scent of chrome and split hide her senses, coined dictions. If Lux nameless girls love me, I'm happy. My city minting history and so on. I, Debbie, with spurred ankles and purple knee skin, stand free to forget species anxiety. What happened to the century? The ship's planks sing, a lithe keel, twins' ears of Catriona, hair of Kathy, Dan's fine nape, Christine's corded hips, Susan's sea scarf moving with me as philosophes into felicity and in the midst of elation, the thrones of Aaron's vowels, a liberal dose, or I have not hulled this waxen heart from the gnarled bowl of a great tree, nor fleshed it with portents and new sports. Swimmers, your sweet strokes beat so fast, I must dare all. I will do lovely things in taxis and count myself among the lucky. I will comb the pale hair of boys with muttering hands, wanting only the satiate fact of that silk. I will discuss perfidy with scholars as if spurning kisses. I will sip the marble marrow of empire. I want sugar, but I shall never wear shame. And if you call that sophistry, then what is love? Toast, whence, giddy swish, so skin-like as a dress, trailing theft as a spill, riddled, cloaks this pink text. For her, we could be female. To burnish would thus shuck with conundrum's beak, but abstruse and dulcet tongues of paint tease carnal wit, in demotic kiss, well, I digress. Who love with tripled pronouns, no pomposities in gender. Debt. We toast her armies from our beds. In my heart as drooping pith, I have often had to seek in events the significance of complicity. For instance, this morning ontology puts my hand into the body, proving the vicarious truancy of self is vernacular. I should want to be intelligible and indifferent, so announce to my internal splice, I am kissing, in order to nourish the foreign part. I believe I am never free of those beautiful woods. They excite me powerfully, as does the ultra-clear manufacture of girlhood. If I broke a branch from the interpretation, what difference would that make? Or as the nakedness in the words break a voice from this tree, a men's chronology. I quote, each nation flowers with fear. What has occasioned us? Pride dilated and idle, far limits purchased by loss. Father, founder, I cry in as much as narrative requires it. The archive of the green hills folds eagerly into neglect. Appendix, Debbie's Folly. 
What if intellectual ambitions were only the imaginary inversion of the failure of temporal ambitions? Proem. Between antiquity and us floats love in the library. I'll import back into antiquity this lexical span, this unfleshed sex, this loosening tear at the mid-afternoon institution. But even a tear refracts the curse of grammar of gender. I'll call it a lens, a wet rhetoric whose long focus gathers the lilies, the roses, the simple daisies from the pleasant grandeur of that Roman walk to offer them to you. Argument. With what suave domesticity Virgil strolls among the deep shelves of the paternal library, the metric pulse of the catalog or calendar charts his walk. To narrate an origin as lapidary, as irrevocable, is only to have chosen with a styled authority from the ranked aisles of thought. For if Virgil has taught me anything, it's that authority is just a rhetoric or style which has asserted the phantom permanency of a context. Shall we consider that it is here, in this crumbling folly of taxonomy, that rhetoric flicks her blithe kilt, tempts one to slip between the shelves, find a nuanced nook where an exchange can take place? All porcelain shepherdesses lead to Rome. They're figurines of rhetoric. If I met one in the library, why would I not trust the cadence drape of her skirt? She will guide me. Narrative might annotate an ambivalence. I follow this shepherdess because I want her. The rhetoric of our identification is marked or sprigged with decorative passages like an eyelet cloth. I want to give her a frock through which ambivalence could proliferate. Virgil recedes into the distance. Debbie tugs at books as loose dresses her cold porcelain clarity so sotto voce it pours like rope. Halfway down the aisle, we drift through a languorous gap in the borrowed alphabet into the surprisingly fearless compatibility of the late classical afternoon. Ships named for women move towards description. They enter narrative as I have entered books. Whose city is this? Over wine-dark lawns, swallows perform auguries, and further back, economy sculpts the harbor. Islands leak like ink into pockets. Dead good queens flounce with civic tenderness. Their unspooled diction drags and flirts. Slick lyric blocks history. Closure ornaments this plight. Narrative is pushing failure. I feel my gender is out there, floating wildly in that harbor. But thought greets an ornament. Failure or closure needs heroes. From the outside, from a position of threat, from rank forests and islands, sirens or queens could disperse his faded trajectory. A guy tests his story against songs and cushions and feasts so that he may continue to produce beginnings. Each beginning is a cleavage. The bower is a pyre. To be left behind is annihilation, so it seems. But thought greets an ornament. I greet an ornament. Hello, shepherdess. Lend me a bit of that stuff, that fancy stuff. So, Virgil, this is how it is. Glass houses envelop narrative. It's a lenience in conversation. One person leans back on purple cushions. The other, having traveled for years towards this meeting, brocades a cunning failure. He is the honored guest. His lounging hostess has provided foaming gold cups, lyres, fretted roof of gold, torches, jewels, 50 serving maids, 100 young pages, rare napkins, this embroidered couch. He may speak with moot authority. I'm observing the scene from outside, the players backlit by a wealth of lamps. I'm out of my neighborhood. The air here is perfumed, the gardens ancient and luxuriant. I am compelled to witness this fresh redundancy through, though I already know the swank and honeyed story. Peroration. Books and girls are real lacunae. Eh? All that we have forgotten about narrative steals back into narrative and watches us with shining eyes. 
narrative deletes its center. A hero's real value lies precisely in the failure of his eschatological ambitions. The transparency of the classical is a gorgeously useless ruse. Somewhere among those flowering transparencies, a shepherdess is hidden. Perhaps she's cataloging the rhetorics of plush ambivalence. Gentle colleagues, imagine yourself as Debbie, then collate these riffs. Dignity's provenance is lax. Proxy twins the bundled ghosts of a fop's apocalypse. Debbie learns the word loveliest, feeds the future to our capsized mouths. There is no outside but the one that, faunal, we make by consignment. Next, we have Jade Palmer. I will be reading Norma Jean Baker of Troy by Anne Carson. Enter Norma Jean Baker. Prologue. This is the Nile and I am a liar. Those are both true. Are you confused yet? The play is a tragedy. Watch closely now how I save it from sorrow. I expect you've heard of the Trojan War and how it was caused by Norma Jean Baker, harlot of Troy. Well, welcome to public relations. That was all a hoax. A bluff, a dodge, a swindle, a gimmick, a gem of a stratagem. The truth is, a cloud went to Troy a cloud in the shape of Norma Jean Baker. The gods arranged it, sort of. They flew me to LA, locked me in a suite of the Chateau Marmont, told me to learn my lines for Clash by Night, a film with Fritz Lang, the famous director. That's enough about him. Speaking of ignorant armies, though, that cloud scam fooled everyone. Maybe a thousand Trojans died at Troy, I feel bad about them. I feel bad about me. You know the phrase, box office poison? How to redeem the good name of Norma Jean? How to explain it all to Arthur? My good husband, Arthur, king of Sparta and New York, dear, honorable, old-fashioned Arthur, who led an army to Troy to win me back. I am, after all, his most prized possession. The Greeks value women less than pure gold, but slightly ahead of oxen, sheep, or goats. But also, and more important, Arthur is a man who believes in war. Men standing shoulder to shoulder, tempered in the fire of battle, himself in a crested helmet, his army rippling around him like bees smelling honey. Arthur gives thanks to the gods every day for the precision of command, which makes order of the anarchy of his heart. A cloud, he'll say, we went to Troy to get a cloud. We lived all those years knee deep in death for the sake of a cloud. I'm not sure he'll believe me. I'm not sure I believe me. Just think. When the Greeks first beached their ships at Troy, they could see a legendary city glittering a mere football field away. It took them 10 years to walk to it. A thousand bloody t-shirts left on the sand. Oh, I need a drink or a big bowl of whipped cream. I've got to think. Norma Jean sits, takes out her knitting. History of war. Lesson one, to make people believe that a replica is the real thing, manipulate the optics of the situation. Managing optics cleverly will generate an alternate version of the facts, which then stands alongside the facts like a cloud in the shape of a woman or a golden Hollywood idol in place of a mousy haired pinup girl from Los Angeles. Case study. The Russian military now uses decoy armaments of a Euripidean design. Life-sized tanks, MIG-31 fighter jets, and missile launchers made of inflatable plastic. A hot air balloon company provides them to the Ministry of Defense. Fallout. 
there may be ethical queries. Point out that war has always made use of camouflage, spies, stealth tactics. Make it clear. Completely convincing unreal weapons able to pop up or vanish in moments are too good to forego. Do not use terms like trickery or deceit. Substitute the playful and musical Russian expression maskarovka, masking. Applications, specific. Move Helen's mask aside momentarily if she wants to spit tequila in your mouth. Applications, general. Trust Euripides, trust Helen, she never went to Troy. Marilyn really was a blonde, and we all go to heaven when we die. As Marilyn used to say, keep the balloon and dare not to worry. Norma Jean continues knitting. Episode one. Enter Greek sailor trying to find his way home from Troy. Sailor sees me, does one of those double takes. Says he can't believe how much I look like her. Thought he'd never see a pair of tits like those again, like these again. Goes on a rant about Norma Jean Baker, the harlot of Troy, that WMD in the forked arm of a woman. He curses her, he spits on her, he calls the gods to spit on her, and so forth. I let him unload it all, then ask about his family, usually where the anger starts. Turns out his brother suicided at Troy, and their dad holds him responsible. Don't bother coming home alone, said dad, and I thought, fuck, those humans, always finding a way to break each other's hearts. But anyway, then we got back to talking of Troy and Norma Jean, whom he was absolutely sure he'd seen the last day at Troy, being dragged off by the hair, as clear as I see you, he says. Who dragged her, I says. Her own husband, he says, Arthur of New York and Sparta. And the next thing he tells me, heartbreak, is Arthur might not be coming back. Rumor has it, Arthur's lost his way sailing home from Troy with Norma Jean, assumed dead, who will save me from Fritz Lang now. Exit, Norma Jean. History of War, Lesson Two. War creates two categories of persons, those who outlive it and those who don't. Both carry wounds. Changing Attitudes. An ancient Homeric catalog of battlefield trauma would include wounds to eyeball, nose, palate, forehead, throat, collarbone, back of skull, nape of neck, upper arm, forearm, heart, lungs, liver, spleen, thigh, knee, shin, heel, ankle. Lasting psychological damage, however keen a concern of modern research, does not seem to have interested the ancient poet. Continuities. On the other hand, Homer has given us Achilles, who went berserk in the midst of battle, Iliad, and Odysseus, who went berserk afterwards, Odyssey. While Euripides makes a hero out of Helen, who was brutalized by merely staring at war too long. Teachable moments. In Euripides' play Helen, we watch Helen watch her husband, Menelaus, as he ambushes and slaughters a boatload of unarmed people. She cheers him on, shouting, where is the glory of Troy? Show it to these barbarians. Discussion topics. Compare and contrast catching a spear in the spleen with utter mental darkness. Consider ancient versus modern experience. Consider whether any of these is what is meant in poetry by a beautiful death. Enter Norma Jean. Enter Norma Jean as Mr. Truman Capote. First choral song. Enter chorus. I am my own chorus. I think of my chorus as Mr. Truman Capote. He was a good friend. He told me the truth. You'll never admit it when you've made a mess, he said to me once, and that was true. I can still hear his funny little girl voice, 
Truman had a voice like a negligee, always slipping off of one bare shoulder. Just a bit. And he hated melodrama, though he loved to quote poetry. Highbrow stuff. Here's one that he says is about me by Stevie Smith. It's called Persephone. I am that Persephone who played with her darlings in Sicily against a background of social security. Oh, what a glorious time we had. Or had we not? They said it was sad. I was born good, grown bad. And isn't that how it always starts? This myth that ends with a girl grown bad. She is in a meadow gathering flowers, twirling her own small sunny hours, when up rides a man on black horses. Up rides a man in a black hat. Up rides a man with a black letter to deliver. Shall I make you my queen? She's maybe 12 or 13. Rape is the story of Helen, Persephone, Norma Jean, Troy. War is the context and God is a boy. Oh, my darlings, they tell you you're born with a precious pearl. Truth is, it's a disaster to be a girl. Up came the black horses and the dark king, and the harsh sunshine was as if it had never been. In the halls of Hades, they said I was queen. Exit Norma Jean as Truman Capote. History of War, Lesson 3. If you pick a flower, if you snatch a handbag, if you possess a woman, if you plunder a storehouse, ravage a countryside or occupy a city, you are a taker. You are taking. In ancient Greek, you use a verb which comes over into Latin as rapio, rapere, raptus sum, and gives us English rapture and rape words stained with a very early blood of girls, with a very late blood of cities, with a hysteria of the end of the world. Sometimes I think language should cover its own eyes when it speaks. Enter Norma Jean as Norma Jean. Episode two, the story so far. Troy down. Thousands dead, Norma Jean to blame, Norma Jean not to blame, Arthur lost at sea, Norma Jean captive, Chateau Marmont. Exit Mr. Truman Capote to lunch with Miss Pearl Bailey. Norma Jean sits, knits a bit, puts down knitting. Here's an aside. I'm not generally a weeping woman, but the sailor told me a bit of news. I didn't mention before about my daughter, my dear one, back in New York. What he heard is that she's dropped out of school and is hoarding her meds. Hermione is her name. She must be 17 now, a golden flower of a girl, a precarious girl. I've wanted to call her so many times, Fritz Lang said no. We can't jeopardize the cloud scam. MGM has a lot invested in this war at Troy. Even beside the movie deals, there's spin-offs, casinos, reality shows. But Hermione, Hermione is my own soul walking around in another body. So here's what I do when I really miss her. I use the wind telephone. A guy in Japan, remember that place in Japan where they had the big wave, the earthquake, and the sea came up over the town, thousands drowned and the ones left behind were so sad they couldn't live. So this guy buys himself an old telephone booth, sets it up by the side of the road on the edge of the town. People can go in and dial a number and talk to the dead, talk to their lost ones, talk to the underworld. It's rotary dial. People find that comforting. Most of them just say, hi, dad, or funny weather these days, or guess what, we got a dog but they come out of the booth smiling. It was said in the town that the phone sometimes rang at odd hours. I've no opinion on that. Exit Norma Jean on wind phone, hand to ear. Hermione, it's me. Hello, 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 hello.
Next we have Octavi Darcy Haig. I'll be reading One Walked Out of Two and Forgot It by Toby Mc McLennan. He took the shape of a bowl in order to eat out of it. He heard the sound come over the hill, but before it reached him, it vanished. He smelled the grass come over the hill, but before it got to him, the smell was gone. He saw a man come over the hill, but before it could reach him, his image ran out. He had a choice of being the wave that rolls in onto the shore or the one that rolls into the sea. He was waiting at a curb for the traffic light to change when something he vaguely recognized crossed in front of him. When the green light flashed, he hurried to catch up and drawing up behind, made an effort to call its attention. He reached out to make contact and suddenly felt his hand slipping over the back of the day. He had gone out for a stroll in the country and had a chance to stop at this particular point. There's a small hill, an empty space, and a large tree. At the bottom of the hill were some stones that might have rolled down from the top or sides at some particular time in the past and now simply rested on the ground. He was standing in the empty space between the tree and the hill, somewhat back and on the far side of the objects. The tree was on his left, the rock and pebbles to his right together. They formed a triangle, any one of them being at a point. He stood still on otherwise flat ground and looked toward us. Another man came into the area. He stood on this side of the tree and the hill and the empty space between them. He saw the other man standing directly across from him. They both looked at each other. That night, he was visiting a friend and they were talking. He began to tell his companions of the strange thing he had seen today. As he was walking in the country, he stopped to look around. He saw a man standing at some distance, but directly across from him. The man was standing in an empty space, somewhat behind, but between a large tree and a smaller hill. The strange thing was that together, with these objects, a perfect triangle was formed. With the man at the apex standing, quite still, looking at him. One day, during the next week, he went to a museum. Objects were all neatly arranged in glass cases and sat on special pieces of cloth. He was moving slowly from case to case when he noticed in one a collection of rocks. Each of these rocks had been dusted and separated from the others. As he looked at each stone, he noticed that every one was just a little different from the next. When he came to the end of the case, his eye was caught by one particular rock. As he looked closer, he saw that embedded in the rock was a small but complete landscape. Three people were sitting in a room talking, talking of, a, talking of time and the inability to reverse it. One person gestured into the space of the room, demonstrating the impossibility of retracing something that has already been done, then brought his hand back to its original position. He misplaced himself on the bus, and when he reboarded the coach, he was unable to recognize himself. When he got home, he realized he had left his feet under the table at the restaurant. One windy day, the smells from a large field blew to one corner and made a nose. The man was walking with a bird. They came upon a crease in the paper. 
he bent down and ripped out a piece of the fold and turned it over in his hand. He looked at it and then put it down in the same place. The bird pecked at the paper until the piece fell through the hole. When the man looked through the hole and saw the paper hit the ground, he painted in the background flat gray. Just as a plant might shoot up in one type of soil and in another, ground might not spread at all. He was growing quite well in a stone. In the middle of his living room stood a frozen Zen life-size model of himself pouring a pitcher of water in a field when he was eight years old. He was dressed in a suit and sitting at the back of a rowboat that was drifting in a motionless sea. For as far as he could see, there was only still a gray sky and the large body of smooth water, except for a gray cube floating far out in the water, which was a man sitting at the back of a motionless rowboat. In order to save the boy, from falling into the hole. He pushed him into it. Four people sat around a table discussing what they were doing. At the moment of doing it, one said, I am now holding my hand in the air. Each raised his hand in the air and in his hand held a scale model of someone sitting alone in a room. Each of the four was alone in his own room. He stood in the chair while he crossed the floor and he picked up the square box as he looked out of the window. He moved the chair closer to him and sat down as he walked out of the empty room. As he couldn't remember it and as she had forgotten, they kept thinking about it. Thank you. Next we have Mahali. Crossing into the old city took the better part of the day. Crossing into the old city took the better part of the day when you were as hungry, as hungry as we were, which was not a nutritional hunger, but rather something deeply emotional. The iron of the bridge becoming stone, becoming ancient and rough as we moved along it, without having altered our course, but the world around us was changing. Eat before you leave was more like forget where you have been because it was impossible to hold this crossing in your mind. The contemporary city did not align with this old one which in its preserved state made a mess of our eyes. How could it just sit there 700 years old, 700? 700 years old, how could it just sit there? We clamored with our bodies to remain upright. Dad with her eyebrows, me with my pelvis, pointing at the sand-colored stone surrounding us. The bridge led to the Barabbas wall, now only half standing. The eastern side of the city exposed, it was brought to us, it was brought to us, it was brought to us in the much celebrated threshold where you are supposed to hold your breath, hold your breath with a hand against the back of your neck as you walk through, as you walk through, as you walk through, it was not necessary, as you walk through, it was not necessary to complete parejas with the customary speech about the long and short of night as there were no residents here, old Ravika, the ancient city, was a museum. 
We were alone. We were alone. In, we were alone. We were alone. We were alone. This was dramatic and strange. But what was more odd was how hard we found it to take in the city visually. We walked through the gate and almost immediately came upon a wall, the backward side of a building. It was one of those situations where you could not step back, not step back, not step back to see the height of it. The sky was too low or too far away. We could not determine, but the walls pulled you then. The, the walls pulled you, the wall pulled the walls pulled you to them. The walls pulled you to them. Dad and I slid along the wall looking for something, a door, a plague, a window by which to see the vaulted chapels I heard so much about. There were no openings, just this length of buildings, of buildings, of building which Dad took on to calling the Alamai. I did not pursue the reference. We stopped when we reached that look with that street, perhaps an avenue. It was a side, a walk, a walk away. It could not have held traffic. The whole, the whole place hap. The, the ground and the separated the one my face in it I wanted I wanted to rub my face in it I I wanted to rub my face in it hello I shouted at the tops of the stairs hi hi I said more calmly as we descended into the depths hi 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 I said hi hi I said as we descended into the depths stop here after depths page 54 continue to yellow sticker if if this is it i said to no one in particular if this is it i said to no one in particular if all there is are rectangles with with windows at the end if it truly is a then b then c and and spoke like that for for, and spoke like that for, for several minutes, and spoke like that for, for, for several minutes, Move to page 95, moving to page 95, read page 95, then go to page 101, page 95. For the next while I stayed close to the hotel, I wandered around, I wandered around the upper floors which were extremely seedy. I worked on my lip sling, the particular, that particular Ravikian method of transposing verbs and proper nouns to account for a speaker's ambivalence, ambivalence, ambivalence. I considered how, and when a speaker's ambivalence, I considered how, how and when I would leave this place and suppress my urge for a new adventure by drinking, drinking, drinking quarts of rice milk. Time slowed, living in this way. The hotel became a sentence, a sentence I struggled, a sentence I struggled to complete. My friends, there are adverbs. In Ravik, however, there are no adverbs. So during certain times of the day, there were no friends, no friends. There was me lying. Lying, lying on my back, lying back on my pillows, recalling incidents. There was a stack of names from out there requiring my attention. Days passed and then a light buzzed in my room. It was Simon calling from below. 
the length of a buzz indicating indicating ind indicating official official dom moving on to page 101 start page 101 kitties on a sticker kitties on a sticker red blue red blue kittens ravika is a vast and s and and sconced and constant was emptying out faster than i could stamp it stamp it stamp it with my tourism stamping with my tourism i had not collected anything a few people, a few people rushed past me, I believed, I believed, I believed, headed towards church. It was morning, church was still important. Though my stay was never over, I had to reach that level of departure. I had to reach that level of chur, of dur, chur, chur departure where any Ravikian artifact would do. That I brought back needed, what I brought back, what I brought back needed to represent, to represent exactly what I was like, what it was, what it was like, with, what, what, we, what it was like to be here. Yellow air swarmed the low level buildings, heavy with loss, heavy with loss, only not in the posture of before. You had to draw closer, 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 claw, claw to things, give up perspective almost. That morning of my walk, to the church district, literally in sleeping Mercury, suddenly and suddenly and suddenly and 103 stop, great Ravikian novelist. Thank you. I would like to thank Kim. I would like to thank René Gladman too for this amazing novel, Event Factory. I'm pleased to meet you all. I hope we get to talk after this. Thank you. Next we have Toby Wama. I'll be reading from The Dark Object by Katrina Palmer. She ignores her stomach and reads in a clear, calm voice. The School of Sculpture Without Objects, Mission Statement. This school was once weighed down by convention and the oppressive need to fulfill expectations. It was committed to a program of education that conformed to internationally recognized standards for art practice and research. And in order to be seen as a center of excellence and innovation, etc., it was an establishment that supported individual production. It promoted diversity, priding itself on its fulfillment of all statutory quotas of the ethnic, the gendered, and the otherwise socially different. Creativity and spontaneity were encouraged. Material was manipulated. Films were produced, performances were enacted, installations were constructed, and so on and so forth, in a manner that we now understand to have inevitably led to its catastrophic decline. Under new management, steered by enlightened intellectuals, we have overhauled the outmoded structures and instituted a postgraduate regime established and maintained by the cutting-edge ideas of radical thought. In its new form, the School of Sculpture Without Objects now strives towards a transcendent ideal with the clear purpose of stripping away form, representation, and expression. The physical manifestations of art are no longer tolerated. The spatio-temporal and visual indulgence of tutorials about the artifact cannot be sustained. Only one student has wormed a way into our institution, and we are dedicated to the re-education of this individual, whose repugnant body will be consistently repressed, and whose mind will be progressively distilled. Our goal is art that is free from form. Our mission is one of purity and immateriality. There must be no object. The secretary looks up from the screen. I think it still needs some work, Rector. The Rector, who had been watching his secretary's mouth as it gently issued his words, rubs a bead of sweat back into the open pores of his forehead and says, it's ideal. Abstract. Addison Cole, alone and locked in the studio, is constructing a space to write in, or writing a space to make in, when an email arrives. Student, please supply an 800-word abstract of your project. Abstract what, exactly? 
How could a summary be extracted from a whole that didn't exist? Why should an abstract be written when there are more immediate concerns, like the effect this punitive confinement might have on the production of art? Addison straightens the desk and considers how fictional spaces, sculptural installations, are actually the sum of the real objects they contain. This leads to thoughts about the relationship between sculpture and fiction in the work of artists like Kabakov, Elmgreen, and Dragset, who have built architectonic structures and realized fantastical worlds, deploying objects to elaborate scenarios, narratives, and characterizations. Addison has no desire to spend time writing this abstract when the reality of fictional constructions needs to be scrutinized and when the familiar gesture of taking an everyday object and calling it art or making art look ordinary can destabilize what is known and what is believed in. All these thoughts are opening themselves out when a second email arrives. Student, please supply your abstract now. Good God, did this school really have nothing better to do than plague its students with demands? Addison sends a question by way of response. Is it possible to utilize narrativized spaces to problematize objecthood, storytelling, the act of production, and the sensuous engagement with ideas? And could the pursuit of such objectives amount to a conceptual materialism? That should hold them off for a while. Apparently without the means to create an object, deprived of a cohort of students, and increasingly distracted by the desire to touch another person, Addison is driven to imagine that object and that touch in the fictional spaces of story writing. In Addison's narratives, ideas about the fabricated object slash objective are employed. They are worked into and through the explicitness of fantasy as well as the ambiguities of reality. Imaginary relationships and scenarios are created. Intense physical experiences are pursued. The molded plastic chair is shifted to align with the center of the desk and, as the studio space is now sufficiently organized, Addison begins writing Zizek's Copernican Turn, introducing a character named Professor Schlavo Zizek. He will be used as a cipher to animate the stories as both their intellectual zenith and the basest, most sordid point of their banality. A third email arrives. Addison, deeply irritated by this persistent intrusion, reads reluctantly. Student, you must condense the project, what has been and will be made, read and written, including the how and why, into precisely 800 words or two sides of A4 paper. You must not undertake or refer to unethical practice. You must not plagiarize or distort another's words or work. Any act of plagiarism will be met with the severest penalty we can devise. The abstract, in line with the rest of your work, must be undertaken independently, without recourse to the assistance or advice of any of the School of Sculpture Without Objects faculty. You must demonstrate critical acumen, the ability to analyze and articulate, to evaluate and contextualize. You will present the facility to assemble and appraise all relevant information and disseminate your conclusions to the widest possible audience. Link your processes with your outcomes and practice with theory. Explain your methodology. Convince the reader and or the viewer that an art practice-based project can be an original contribution to knowledge. Abstract project from practice and commit it to the page. Well, really, apart from the ridiculous self-aggrandizement and onerous bureaucracy of this exercise, it was clear to Addison that, at its most fundamental level, to write an abstract would be an inherently paradoxical undertaking. The composition must not expand, but rather present itself as a reduction. And within that deflated text was the project, both sculpture and writing, to be presented in a non-representational way? The object slash objective would be a document consisting of exclusions. About to dismiss the task for its perverse negativity, Addison suddenly recalls Maurice Blanchot's claim that because nothing is made present, the only thing writing manifests is writing representing the unpresentable. Addison decides this task is no more paradoxical than any other. The abstract, like the Hegelian subject, can only find itself in its own negation. Somewhere between the writing and the abstracting, 800 words will be composed, an A4-sized space will be inhabited, and a thing will be created. The pathos of the act will have a material result, the object called abstract. The contrary nature of this object means it has to be approached from an oblique angle, fictionalized, perhaps. Addison stands at a distance and considers the space with a blank expression. Internal Memorandum, the School of Sculpture Without Objects, re Addison Cole. It has been brought to our attention that the student Addison Cole intends to, and we quote, make an object. This must not be allowed to happen under any circumstances. Cole says the object would not be unduly sensual in any way, and it might even be text-based as if the size of its material presence could render it either acceptable or less superfluous, when quite obviously any object will be excessive. 
Material will be manipulated. A thing will be made manifest. One can only surmise what horrific contrivance will be produced. And we must beware. The less obvious the object is, the more undermining is its potential, as it may not be noticed among things in general. It has also been rumored that a health and safety meeting will be convened in order to suggest that if an object is introduced to the school, it could perhaps be viewed from a distance and from the corner of one's eye. No. If we allow this to be considered, we lay ourselves open to a creeping mass of distasteful substances impressing their sensations, masquerading as, and with, real things. Cole has displayed signs of fatuous negativity in the past. Remember the wardrobe incident. An investigation must be undertaken to find the origin of this latest development. In our opinion, it was the introduction of a break in the program that allowed Cole space to withdraw and dream up this plan. What has emerged from this recess is tantamount to the erection of a substitute symbolic reality and, be in no doubt, is designed to undermine the school's ethos. The only fabrication or fantasy that our student must engage in is the one we have constructed. Of course, Cole will inevitably fail, but it is as the failed gesture that the aforementioned object presents the greatest threat. For what if the object is not more than the nothing that we have, but is rather less than? What if the object is what is missing? In accordance with our previous instructions, the studio has for some time been sealed from the outside with coal in it. With solemn conviction, we recommend that this situation is made permanent. NB. Naturally, the program is to continue in Cole's absence. Addison knows full well that Hegel is dead, but is nevertheless making preparations for the tutorial. There is no actual work to show Hegel, as Addison has not created a single object since enrolling at the school, so the preparations involve trying to look as if engaged in a task, some thoughts of what to talk to Hegel about, and locating a chair for him to sit on. Additional time is then spent arranging the chairs. Addison's chair faces Hegel's. The distance between them is at least three paces, so there would be no bodily contact. However, they are placed just close enough to enable easy conversation. These preparations have been a satisfying distraction from what is otherwise a familiarly unproductive routine. Remembering there will be a report to be filled in, Addison retrieves the relevant form from amongst a mass of paperwork. It is a three-page document headed, Tutorial Report, evidence that a tutorial took place. Leafing through the blank report, Addison mutters, what do they take me for? They think I can't see that the sole purpose of these institutionally pathologized rituals is to inject my already wretched situation with the poison of bureaucratic inanity? Addison stops talking and decides the time spent waiting for Hegel could best be filled by completing the report. This is not to make a mockery of the procedure, not to lie, but to look at it more as a prediction of what is likely to be said. So Addison writes the following text in the section headed, Summary of the Discussion. Hegel wanted to know why I had requested a tutorial with him and what I thought of being surrounded by objects and not people. I didn't really know, but I guess the tutorial would be over before it began unless I made an effort to be communicative. So I said, there are objects here and, well, not much else really. Maybe I'm not very sociable. He pulled his chair slightly closer to mine, sighed, and told me that my relationships with objects will only be important if I can dissolve any sense of myself. I replied, but I need my objects. I know I'm something other to them. I feel emotion, I think, and I can say, I am, and they're not. Hegel said it is not enough for me to say I am because I think. I should ask myself further questions about what I am. His assertion was that I am a thinking thing, but I am only a thinking thing because I think of things. The work as work sets up a world. Addison stands with a bowed head and a body that leans its diminishing weight into a flat hand on the supportive but unresponsive surface of the desk. The final show is around the corner, and there is nothing more in the studio than a pile of stories and a collection of furniture, and none of it does anything more than reflect the institutional, spatial, and ideological constraints of the school environment. The knot in Addison's stomach is the fear that the school has been successful in its conditioning, not because they have lessened the desire to make an object, or to touch and be sensually engaged with the world. These desires are there more than ever. No. Their real success is in the fact that their student realizes it is always already impossible to produce a credible object. Sullen and defeated, Addison now believes an object is just a thing, irrelevant, stupid, and dumb. Anyone repeatedly trying to add a real object to the world will eventually be crushed by the weight of its impossibility. Anything the student fabricates, appropriates, 
assembles, performs, or even conceives and calls art will be pathetic in the face of the impossible historical and cultural weight of that title. But in spite of the appeal of object-free, language-based conceptualism, Addison wants to present work made from the tension between concept and the presence of form. It will be a gross object that is also a narrativized idea. It might even be a gross idea. Addison's hand glides across the surface of the desk. If I have to work with what's already here, then I may as well take the inane blandness of this desk or my chair as my object for the final show. I'll leave it in an unassuming corner of the school, and because it's an institutional piece of furniture, they won't notice it, won't even see it. It is, and will continue to be, part of the fabric of the space. My desk will be a realistic artwork so accurate in its representation of the thing that it is the thing itself. But it's more sinister than that. It'll be dark. Its ordinariness will subtly obscure its presence. A sneaky, unnoticed stain lurking in the shadows and spoiling their pseudo-conceptual edifice. It occurs to Addison that there is something Heideggerian in these thoughts. An ordinary object concealing itself in its earthy materiality and simultaneously unconcealing or disclosing the significance of its being as a thing. It will, after all, not be totally held back because it will perform its deskness and designating that deskness as an artwork will set up a world. A world, in this sense, need not necessarily mean a total environment or an installation or a narrative. It can be a singular object. Addison's voice is almost silent for fear of detection. If my understanding of Heidegger is right, then something is produced or formed or opened when a world is set up. And that's what the object does. It starts worlding. When the world of the table is disclosed, brought forward, there will be a disclosure of its being, a sensuous presencing, and I'll have slipped it under the school's radar, a desk being their desk. Addison realizes that in claiming the ready-made ordinary desk, the act of naming, which attempts to designate it as art, will almost certainly be self-defeating because it will mean the object, the desk, is no longer ordinary. Preparing for a show is never easy, but Addison can't work out if these thoughts are rational or an anxiety trip compounded by the intensity of light in the room. Looking up into the fluorescent strip on the ceiling, Addison is suddenly aware that although the desk lamp can be turned on and off, this light from above is surely permanently on. And disturbingly, there is no switch for it on the wall. For how long? Addison can't figure it out and doesn't understand why. Of all the school's torturous control systems, this one seems to show how low-down nasty the regime can sink. This beam from above has been ablaze with light, when all Addison needs is the calm of occasional darkness behind which to think and plan a resistance. The never-dark locked room holds a hungry prisoner, untouched and undernourished. Beyond the burning that gnaws at Addison's gut is the need to be part of concrete social reality, and for that reality to be normal, the want of change and development and a longing for the constructive activity of producing new and substantial work. Even if nothing new was made, the already existing fabric of things could be altered enough for someone to notice, and a connection would be made with this other person. It would take just one person. You can surely die from the want of the warmth of human contact, and yet the paradox of the situation is laughable. After all the anti-object assertions of the school and its sanctimonious proclamations against physicality, Addison's most powerful thought is that of making contact with another body. This idea is the only productive element in Addison's barren universe. Addison picks up the computer, puts it on the floor next to the printer, and then lifts the two front legs of the desk so it tips backwards, sending the accumulated sheets of paper, along with pens, pencils, and notebooks, sliding slowly off the edge of the surface, so there is now space on top to clamber on and stand in the middle of. It doesn't feel stable. If it had been solidly crafted out of mahogany, it would have been stable, but it's a wood-chip, compound, formica-topped institutional surface on mean metal legs. Even though it sways from side to side along with the student's movement, it's unlikely to break. And the attempt to tackle the light is to no avail anyway, as even with a fully stretched arm, the unusually high ceiling is still a meter or so out of reach. It occurs to Addison that a heavy object, like the printer, could be thrown at the light. A bit of commotion and a few sparks would be a gratifying interruption to the endless blankness of existence within the school of sculpture without objects. And perhaps there'd be an electrical fire which would burn the school down. 
Bringing this sadistic institution to such a melodramatic end would make Addison very happy indeed. Thank you. Next we have Dustin Ariel Segura Suarez. I'll be reading Thomas Obscure by Maurice Blanchot. <laughs> Thomas s'assit et regarda la mer. Pendant quelque temps, il resta immobile comme s'il était venu là pour suivre les mouvements des autres nageurs. Et bien que la brume l'empêchait de voir très loin, il demeura avec obstination les yeux fixés sur les corps qui avançaient difficilement dans l'eau. Puis, une vague plus forte que les autres l'ayant touché, il descendit à son tour sur la pente de sable et glissa au milieu des remous qui le submergèrent rapidement. La mer était tranquille et Thomas avait l'habitude de nager longtemps sans fatigue. Il n'avait donc pas à s'inquiéter de l'effort qu'il lui fallait soutenir, quoique le but qu'il s'était fixé lui parut soudain très éloigné et qu'il éprouva une sorte de gêne à aller vers une région dont les abords lui étaient inconnus. Ce qui lui permettait habituellement de ne pas craindre la fatigue, c'est qu'il connaissait le chemin qu'il parcourait, qu'il retrouvait à travers l'eau comme quelque chose de familier qu'il savait, qu savait pouvoir suivre jusqu'au bout sans que les forces vinssent à lui manquer. Mais aujourd'hui, il n'en était pas de même. Il avait choisi un itinéraire nouveau, et loin de distinguer les points de repère qui lui auraient montré la bonne route, il avait peine à reconnaître l'eau dans laquelle il glissait. Cependant, il ne fit aucun effort pour revenir en arrière. La brume cachait le rivage, et son espoir n'était pas dans la possibilité d'atteindre la terre à nouveau, mais il se portait vers un but plus important et plus difficile qu'il n'avait encore qu'entrevu. Non loin de lui, alors que jusqu'à présent il s'était débattu dans une solitude qui lui pesait, il aperçut un nageur dont les mouvements le surprirent par leur rapidité et leur aisance. C'était un spectacle qu'il aurait voulu admirer tout à, tout à loisir. Lui-même n'en ressentait que davantage à l'assitude qui l'apesantissait. Mais il éprouvait aussi un sentiment consolant, et il aurait voulu avoir assez de force pour crier et obtenir un autre cri en réponse. Sa voix essayait donc de s'élever au-dessus du bruit que les vagues agitaient dans un tourbillon incessant. Il prévoyait que le son allait se perdre dans le fracas qui l'assourdissait, mais il fut au contraire surpris par le cri distinct et vif vibrant qui jaillit parmi les sifflements du vent et qui semblait éclater dans un silence qu'il déchirait. Néanmoins, le nageur négligea l'appel et son indifférence parut si incompréhensible que ce fut comme s'il avait été rayé de la réalité. Nager devint alors pour Thomas une activité dont l'importance ne cessa de grandir, quoiqu'il eût l'impression qu'elle s'exerçait d'une manière étrange. Un nuage était descendu sur la mer et la surface de l'eau se perdait dans une lueur blafarde qui semblait la seule chose vraiment réelle. Des remous très violents secouèrent le corps de Thomas, attirant ses bras et ses jambes dans des directions différentes, sans pourtant, sans pourtant lui donner le sentiment d'être au milieu des vagues et de rouler dans des éléments qu'il connaissait. La certitude que l'eau manquait imposa même à son effort pour nager le caractère d'un exercice tragique et en même temps non sérieux dont il ne retirait que du découragement. Peut-être suffit-il, il suffit qu'il se maîtrisa pour chasser ses pensées désolées, mais ses regards ne pouvaient s'accrocher à rien et il lui semblait qu'il contemplait le vide dans l'intention absurde d'y trouver quelques secours. Pourtant, un bateau sortit du brouillard, lentement d'abord puisqu'il disparaissait à intervalles réguliers dans des ténèbres qui ne consistaient que dans cette disparition, puis il surgit si près que Thomas aurait pu déchiffrer les inscriptions qui, bri qui brillaient sur la coque s'il avait voulu s'en donner la peine. Était-ce parce que le bateau était vide? Il le laissa s'éloigner avec autant d'indifférence que s'il avait distingué dans cette image une promesse illusoire, et il continua de nager en homme qui, ayant oublié totalement le péril, prenait un vif plaisir à ce qu'il faisait. L'imprudence de sa conduite apparut lorsque la mer, soulevée par le vent, se déchaîna avec une violence qui sembla tout de suite d'autant plus redoutable qu'il était difficile d'en suivre les effets. On pouvait croire que la tempête troublait l'eau au point de la disperser dans des régions inaccessibles et que les rafales d'un vent impétueux allaient bouleverser le ciel, mais en même temps, il y avait un silence et un calme qui laissaient penser que tout déjà était détruit et l'étendue de la mer se confondait avec une de ces landes désertes où le passant finit par douter de sa propre existence. Thomas chercha à avancer en se dégageant du flot fade qui l'envahissait de tous côtés, un froid très vif, aussi vif que si l'hiver avait soudain apporté des glaces, paralysa ses bras qui lui semblèrent lourds et étrangers. L'eau tourna autour de lui en tourbillon. Était-ce réellement de l'eau? Tantôt l'écume voltigeait devant ses yeux comme des flocons blanchâtres, Tantôt, c'était l'absence de l'eau qui prenait son corps et ses jambes et les entraînait violemment. Il eut donc rapidement l'impression désagréable d'être enchaîné à une illusion dont le caractère lui échappait. 
Il respira plus lentement et garda quelques instants dans la bouche le liquide que les rafales poussaient contre sa tête. Mais ce n'était rien d'autre qu'une douceur tiède, le breuvage étrange d'un homme privé de goût. Puis il s'aperçut que ses membres, soit à cause de la fatigue, soit pour une raison inconnue, lui donnaient la même sensation d'étrangeté que l'eau dans laquelle il roulait. Chaque fois qu'il réfléchissait sur la manière dont ses mains disparaissaient puis réapparaissaient dans un état d'indifférence totale à l'égard de l'avenir, avec une sorte d'irréalité dont il n'avait pas le droit de prendre conscience, il était tout, il était tout prêt à croire qu'il éprouverait bien des, diffi des difficultés impossibles à prévoir pour se tirer d'affaires. Il ne se découragea pas. Le sentiment du danger était même tout à fait écarté du malaise que lui causait cette, que lui causait cette situation. Qu'avait-il à craindre? Mais son cas n'en était pas meilleur, car bien qu'il pût se maintenir indéfiniment dans l'eau, ou quelque chose d'insupportable à nager ainsi à l'aventure avec un corps qui lui servait uniquement, il s'en rendait compte maintenant à penser qu'il nageait. Ce n'était d'ailleurs pas tout. Il s'écoula peu de temps avant que sa peau lui parût sumectée d'une manière anormale. De grosses plaques d'humidité couvrirent les bras et la poitrine. Comme il ne pouvait examiner sérieusement ce qui se passait, il se contenta d'attribuer cette impression à l'engourdissement et il laissa son bras flotter doucement à la surface, comme s'il avait nagé avec un corps fluide, identique à l'eau où il pénétrait. La sensation fut d'abord agréable. Tout ce qu'il pouvait se représenter, c'est qu'il poursuivait en nageant une sorte de rêverie dans laquelle il se confondait avec la mer. L'ivresse de sortir lui-même, de glisser dans le vide, de se disperser dans la pensée de l'eau, lui faisait oublier l'impression pénible contre laquelle il luttait et qui avait pris possession de lui comme une nausée. Et même lorsque cette mer idéale, qui devenait de plus en plus intimement, fut devenue à son tour la vraie mer où il était comme noyé, il ne fut pas aussi ému qu'il aurait dû l'être. Il éprouva plutôt un soulagement, comme s'il eût enfin découvert la clé de la situation et comme si tout se fût borné pour lui à continuer avec une absence d'organisme, dans une absence de mer, son, vo son voyage interminable. Mais ce qu'il y avait d'enfantin dans cette vue des choses ne résista pas aux événements. Il commença par rouler de bord sur l'autre, comme un bateau à la dérive, dans l'eau qui lui servait de corps pour nager. La sensation de quelque chose de très vague, semblable à une douleur dont l'intensité leur est empêchée d'en trouver l'origine, passa à travers ses membres. Il se dit qu'il ne pourrait bientôt plus chercher d'issue et il sentit combien il était dérisoire de lutter, de lutter pour ne pas être emporté par la vague qui était son bras. Il fut en effet très vite submergé et son état d'âme ressembla à celui d'un être qui se serait noyé amèrement en soi. C'eût été sans doute le moment de s'arrêter. Il n'avait guère de force pour aller plus loin et le froid devenait insupportable. Mais un espoir lui resta. Il nagea encore comme s'il était devenu le poisson intérieur de sa propre mère comme si au sein de son intimité restaurée, il eût pu découvrir une possibilité nouvelle pour continuer à nager. Était-ce quelque chose qu'il avait eu raison de faire? Il se trouva mieux. Il avait l'impression agréable de respirer avec des branchies et de vivre de bulles d'air invisible qui se formaient au fond de lui. Il estima même si compl complètement récompensé qu'au lieu de s'en tenir là, il se laissa entraîner par des transformations auxquelles il aurait peut-être pu résister, mais dont son premier succès l'empêchait de peser toutes les conséquences. Ce qu'il voyait, c'est que se rapprochant d'une existence de plus en plus élémentaire, il était moins exposé, mieux placé pour aller aussi loin qu'il le faudrait. Il nageait mieux, comme un monstre privé de nageoire. Sous le microscope géant, il se faisait amas, entreprenant de cils et de vibrations qui battaient infatigablement l'eau. La tentation prit un caractère tout à fait insolite. Lorsqu'il chercha à nager non plus dans la goutte d'eau, mais dans une région vague, idéale, qui était ici et non pas là, quelque chose comme un lieu sacré où se serait trouvé dans la matière, même au-delà de la matière, il avait de la pensée secrète que ce lieu lui était si bien approprié qu'il lui suffisait d'être là pour être. C'était comme un creux imaginaire où il s'enfonçait parce que, avant qu'il y fût, son empreinte réelle y était déjà marquée. Il fit donc un dernier effort pour s'y engager totalement. Cela fut presque facile. Il ne, rencontra, ne rencontrait aucun obstacle. Il avait l'impression qu'il s'unissait à lui-même en s'installant dans ce lieu où nul autre ne pouvait venir, où il devait trouver un repos que personne ne pouvait lui disputer. Mais l'illusion ne dura pas. Finalement, il dut revenir. Et comme le rivage était tout proche, contrairement à ce qu'il pensait, il lui fut aisé de trouver le chemin du retour. Il prit pied sans peine à un endroit qu'il était une sorte de falaise d'un accès difficile et que quelques nageurs utilisaient pour plonger. La fatigue avait disparu et quand le vent eut fini de sécher l'eau qui lui ruissellait sur, sur tout le corps, il n'y eut plus de traces de ce qui venait de se passer. Toutefois, il garda encore l'impression d'un bourdonnement dans les oreilles et des brûlures dans les yeux, comme il fallait s'y attendre après un trop long séjour dans l'eau salée. Il s'en rendait surtout compte lorsque, se tournant vers la nappe sans fin sur laquelle le soleil se reflétait, 
Il essayait de voir dans quelle direction il s'était éloigné. Il avait alors un véritable brouillard devant les yeux et il était tout prêt à distinguer n'importe quoi dans ce vide trouble que ses regards cherchaient fiévreusement à percer. À force des pieds, il découvrit un homme qui nageait très loin, à demi perdu sous l'horizon, et dont l'éloignement ne permettait pas d'observer les mouvements. À une pareille distance, il y avait peu de moyens de faire des constatations sérieuses, et le nageur ne cessait d'échapper à la vue, ne, redeven ne redevenant invisible qu'au moment où son existence pouvait être mise définitivement en doute. Thomas se maintint à son poste avec obstination. Comme si ses yeux fatigués avaient été plus perçants que des yeux en bon état, il continuait de suivre toutes les évolutions de celui qu'on pouvait vraiment croire disparu et qui, même s'il avait été là, n'aurait pu passer que pour une épave sans intérêt. Cette absence, loin de le gêner, avivait encore sa curiosité. Non seulement il avait l'impression de le percevoir, toujours très bien, mais il se sentait rapproché de lui d'une manière tout à fait intime et comme il n'aurait pu l'être davantage par aucun autre contact. Il resta plusieurs instants à regarder et à attendre, il y avait dans cette contemplation quelque chose de douloureux, quelque chose de difficilement supportable qui était comme le sentiment d'une liberté trop grande, d'une liberté obtenue par la rupture de tous les liens. Son visage se troubla et prit une, expri une expression inusitée. Il se décida pourtant à tourner le dos à la mer et il s'engagea dans un petit bois où il s'étendit après avoir fait quelques pas. La journée allait se terminer. Il n'y avait presque plus de lumière et ce qu'il en restait semblait effrayer les oiseaux, les oiseaux dont les cris éveillaient des égouts des échos et désagréables. Cependant, en dépit de l'obscurité, on pouvait continuer à voir assez distinctement certains détails du paysage, et en particulier la colline qui bordait l'horizon et qui brillait comme si le crépuscule l'eût laissé insouciante et libre. Malheureusement, les arbres étaient également très éclairés, et à l'impression de liberté succédait l'impression d'un spectacle commun et pénible dont on avait hâte de voir la fin. Les arbres n'avaient plus l'air d'être des arbres, ils se détachaient en vain dans l'air lumineux, il semblait que le feuillage, frappé par les rayons étincelants, devint terne et fut soumis à l'éclairage d'un triste jour. Ce qui inquiétait Thomas, c'est qu'il était couché là, dans l'herbe, avec le désir de ne pas se relever avant longtemps, bien que cette position lui fût formellement interdite. Comme l'air était déjà lourd et que la nuit tombait rapidement, il essaya de mettre un genou à terre et, les deux mains appuyées sur le sol, il se redressa à demi, tandis que son autre jambe se balançait d'une manière capricieuse. Il fit un nouveau mouvement et réussit, malgré lui, à se tenir tout à fait droit dans une attitude à la fois orgueilleuse et souffrante. Il était donc debout. À la vérité, il y avait dans sa façon d'être une indécision qui laissait un doute sur ce qu'il faisait. Ainsi, quoiqu'il eût les yeux fermés, il ne semblait pas qu'il eût renoncé à voir dans les ténèbres. C'était même tout le contraire. De même, quand il se mit à marcher, il se pencha en avant avec une répugnance visible. Et l'on pouvait croire que c'était non pas ses jambes, mais son désir de ne pas marcher qu'il faisait avancer. Il descendit dans une sorte de cave où l'obscurité était complète. La disposition en apparut tout de suite incommode à un point inimaginable, car partout où il portait les mains, il se heurtait brutalement à une paroi. Cela ne l'empêcha pas d'essayer d'avancer. En avant, en arrière, et même au-dessus de lui, une maçonnerie très solide lui barrait la route. Et ce n'était pas le plus grand obstacle. Il fallait aussi compter sur sa volonté, sa volonté qui était farouchement décidée à le laisser dormir là, dans un oubli absolu, dans une passivité pareille à la mort. Folie, donc Toutefois, s'il lui nourrit par un désir irré 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 irrésistible avec le contraire de son désir, il éprouva le besoin de rechercher s'il restait maître de la situation. Avec les moyens habituels, il lui fallut renoncer à tout espoir, mais était-ce une situation ordinaire? La manière dont il avait pénétré dans ce lieu, si obscur qu'en fussent les circonstances, montrait qu'un certain nombre de façons de penser devaient être ici abandonnées et qu'il pouvait indifféremment se considérer comme ayant ou n'ayant pas un corps sain, vigoureux et pour tout dire réel. Dans cette incertitude, il chercha à tâtons les limites de la fausse voûtée et, étendant les bras, il plaça son corps tout contre le mur, son corps qui n'existait pas comme, comme corps et qui, dans ce lieu, ne ferait pas plus de traits observables que son esprit même. Ce qu'il dominait, c'était le sentiment qu'il était poussé en avant par son refus d'avancer. Il fut saisi par cette pensée et il en conclut que l'obstacle infranchissable de la paroi pourrait un jour disparaître et qu'il serait alors porté plus loin sans savoir comment. Il n'eut donc pas à s'étonner, tant son anxiété lui faisait distinctement voir l'avenir, lorsqu'un peu plus tard, il constata qu'il avait gagné quelque part. Quelque part, c'était à n'y pas croire. Pourtant, à bien juger, son avance était plus apparente que réelle, puisque ce nouveau lieu ne se distinguait en rien de l'ancien qu'il rencontrait les mêmes difficultés que c'était d'une certaine manière le même lieu d'où il s'éloignait par la terreur de s'en éloigner. Tout semblait se passer dans son fort intérieur. C'était comme s'il avait marché dans un chemin que l'angoisse lui ouvrait et qui n'existait qu'en lui, 
Et cependant, ce chemin n'était pas imagine, imaginaire. Mais il avait, ceci, il avait ceci de particulier que dès qu'on s'y était engagé, on y avançait qu'avec un corps fait des pensées et des désirs les plus intimes. Thomas ne, compre, ne comprit pas tout de suite ce qu'il en était et il commit l'imprudence de jeter un regard autour de lui. Manifestement, la nuit était plus sombre et plus pénible qu'il ne pouvait s'y attendre. L'obscurité, tout submergé. Il n'y avait aucun espoir d'en percer les ombres, mais on en atteignait la réalité dans une relation dont l'intimité était bouleversante. La première observation de Thomas fut qu'il pouvait encore se servir de son corps, en particulier de ses yeux. Ce n'était pas qu'il vit quelque chose, mais ce qu'il regardait dédaignait ses regards sans lui permettre de les détourner. Cela suffit à la longue pour le faire entrer en rapport avec une masse nocturne, nocturne qu'il percevait vaguement comme étant lui-même et dans laquelle il baignait. Naturellement, il ne formula cette remarque à titre d'hypothèse comme une vue qui était commode mais à laquelle il n'attachait aucun crédit. Seule la nécessité de démêler des circonstances tout à fait nouvelles l'obligea à s'y accrocher et même à s'aventurer dans d'autres conclusions non moins risquées. Comme il n'avait aucun moyen pour mesurer le temps, il se passa probablement des heures avant qu'il acceptât cette façon de voir. Mais pour lui-même, ce fut comme si la crainte l'avait emporté tout de suite. C'est avec un sentiment de honte qu'il leva la tête en accueillant l'idée qu'il avait caressée, à savoir qu'en dehors de lui se trouvait quelque chose de semblable à sa propre pensée, tandis qu'au fond de lui, un organisme d'avorton avait pris momentanément la place de l'âme. En toute autre circonstance, une telle rêverie lui aurait vivement répugné, et même ici, elle n'était pas agréable à supporter. Néanmoins, son malaise ne venait pas du peu de vraisemblance qu'elle qu avait, car, après tout, la situation autorisait beaucoup d'extravagance. Mais à force de se croire en contact avec une intelligence que son regard ou sa main pouvait toucher, il se laissait gagner par un sentiment d'effroi dont il ne réussissait pas à triompher. La nuit lui parut bientôt plus sombre, plus terrible que n'importe quelle autre nuit, comme si elle était réellement sortie d'une blessure de la pensée qui ne se pensait plus, de la pensée prise ironiquement comme objet par autre chose que la pensée, c'était la nuit même. Des images qui faisaient son obscurité l'inondaient et le corps, transformé en un esprit démoniaque, cherchait à se les représenter. Il ne voyait rien et, loin d'être accablé, il faisait de cette absence de vision le point culminant de son regard. Son œil, inutile pour voir, prenait des proportions extraordinaires, se développait d'une manière démesurée et, s'étendant sur l'horizon, laissait la nuit pénétrer en son centre pour se créer un iris. Par ce vide, c'était donc le regard et l'objet du regard qui se démêlait. Non seulement cet œil qui ne voyait rien appréhendait quelque chose, mais il appréhendait la, appréhendait la cause de sa vision. Il voyait comme un objet ce qui faisait qu'il ne voyait pas. En lui, son propre regard entrait sous la forme d'une image au moment tragique où ce regard était considéré comme la mort de toute image. Il en résulta pour Thomas des pré préoccupations nouvelles. Sa solitude ne lui sembla pas aussi complète que tout à l'heure et il eut même le sentiment que quelque chose de réel l'avait heurté et cherchait à se glisser en lui. C'était une sensation absurde qu'il aurait pu interpréter d'une manière moins fantastique. Il aurait fort bien pu croire, par exemple, que son œil s'était blessé et que la gêne qu'il éprouvait l'empêchait de distinguer ce qui se passait. Mais il fallait toujours qu'il allât au pire. Pourtant, il y avait une excuse à sa crédulité. C'est que cette impression était si distincte et si pénible qu'il était presque impossible de n'y pas céder. Même s'il avait contesté la réalité du premier phénomène, il aurait eu le plus grand mal à ne pas croire à quelque chose d'extraordinaire, car de toute évidence, un corps étranger s'était logé dans sa pupille et s'efforçait d'aller plus loin. C'était insensé et horriblement gênant. C'était d'autant plus gênant qu'il ne s'agissait pas d'un petit objet, mais d'arbre entier, de tout le bois frissonnant encore et plein de vie dans lequel lui-même se trouvait il y avait peu d'instants. Il ressentit cela comme une faiblesse qui l'inquiétait pour l'avenir, comme quelque chose dont il avait honte et qui le discréditait. Il ne fit même plus attention aux détails des événements. Peut-être un homme se glissa-t-il par la même ouverture il n'aurait pu ni l'affirmer ni le nier. Il lui sembla aussi que la mer montait jusqu'à lui et que les vagues parvenaient à pénétrer dans l'espace d'abîme qu'il était. Mais tout cela ne le préoccupait plus que médiocrement. Il n'avait d'attention que pour ses mains qui, comme si elles s'étaient trouvées au fond de son corps, cherchaient à reconnaître les êtres qui étaient descendus et dont il distinguait partiellement le caractère, quoiqu'ils fussent en général incomplet, chien n'ayant qu'une oreille pour substituer oiseau remplaçant l'arbre sur lequel il chantait, tout en servant d'organe à Thomas, ces êtres se livraient à des actes qui échappaient à toute interprétation. Grâce à eux, des édifices, des villes entières se construisirent, villes réelles faites de vivres et de milliers de pierres entassées qui se divisèrent ensuite sous l'action d'une pensée mathématique, ne laissant derrière elles que les nombres qui étaient leur âme secrète. C'est sur ces ruines qui roulaient dans le sang et déchiraient parfois les artères que d'autres créatures apparurent, sans comprendre tout à fait ce qui arrivait, Thomas sentit que ce qu'il appelait jadis des passions et des idées prenait maintenant en lui la forme d'existence particulière. 
La peur s'empara de lui et elle ne distinguait en rien de son cadavre. Le désir le, était ce même cadavre qui ouvrait les yeux et qui, en se sachant mort, remontait maladroitement jusque dans la bouche comme un animal avalé vivant. Les sentiments l'habitèrent puis le dévorèrent. Il était pressé dans chaque partie de sa chair par mille mains qui n'étaient que sa main. Une mortelle angoisse battait contre son cœur. Il savait qu'autour de son corps, sa pensée confondue avec la nuit veillait. Il savait terrible certitude qu'elle aussi cherchait une issue pour entrer en lui. Elle luttait comme la marée irrésistible qui monte contre ses lèvres dans sa bouche. Elle s'efforçait une union monstrueuse. Sous les paupières, elle créait un regard nécessaire et en même temps, elle détruisait furieusement ce visage qu'elle embrassait. Ville prodigieuse, cité ruinée, disparue, les pierres furent rejetées au dehors. On transplanta les arbres, on, en prend, on emporta les mains et les cadavres. Seul le corps de Thomas substitua privé de sens et la pensée rentrée en lui échangea des contacts avec le vide. Merci. Next, we have Sophie Richardson. Je vais lire le premier chapitre de L'Astragale par Albertine Sarrazin. Le ciel s'était éloigné d'au moins dix mètres. Je restais assise, pas pressée. Le choc avait dû casser les pierres. Ma main droite tâtonnait sur des éboulis. À mesure que je respirais, le silence atténuait l'explosion d'étoiles dont les retombées crépitaient encore dans ma tête. Les arêtes blanches des pierres éclairaient faiblement l'obscurité. Ma main quitta le sol, passa sur mon bras gauche, remonta jusqu'à l'épaule, descendit à travers côte jusqu'au bassin. Rien. J'étais intacte. Je pouvais continuer. Je me mis debout. Le nez brusquement projeté contre les ronces, étalé en croix, je me rappelais que j'avais omis de vérifier aussi mes jambes. Trouant la nuit, des voix sages et connues chantonnaient. « Attention, Anne, tu finiras par te casser une patte. » Je me remis en position assise et recommençai à m'explorer. Cette fois, je rencontrais, au niveau de la cheville, une grosseur étrange qui enflait et pulsait sous mes doigts. Lorsque je vais à la consultation, tout bib, pour essayer de me faire porter pâle, que je vous décris des mots imaginaires dans des endroits que je pense inaccessibles, lorsque je vais vous montrer des tisanes au lit, petite sœur, sur mes pieds de marcheuse au modèle, moi qui envie vos indigestions, fini tout cela. Maintenant, vous allez me soigner. Vous ou d'autres, j'ai la patte cassée. Je levais les yeux vers le haut du mur où ce monde restait endormi. J'ai volé, mes chéris. J'ai volé, plané et tournoyé pendant une seconde qui était longue et bonne, un siècle. Et je suis là, assise, délivrée de là-haut, délivrée de vous. Cet après-midi encore, j'étais bourré d'atropine et je m'étais injecté de la benzine dans les cuisses. Rolande libérée, je n'avais aucune envie d'attendre qu'elle revienne me chercher. Je manœuvrais pour me faire envoyer à l'hôpital, où la cueillette serait plus facile et les jours plus vite pulvérisés. « Mais vous êtes verte, me dit l'éducatrice à la veillée. « J'ai dû me frotter au mur, dis-je, sentant mes joues virer au cadavérique et me désarticulant comme pour tâcher d'apercevoir le dos de ma blouse. » On était justement en train de repeindre les murs de la salle à manger, un mur jaune, un mur bleu, deux murs verts et les appuis de fenêtres en orange pour inventer le soleil. « Non, vous êtes verte, vous. Votre figure, ça ne va pas? » Mais je n'ai pas eu le temps de savourer mon premier tilleul. La pente douce de l'autre côté des remparts, après la porte, je ne la descendrai pas. J'ai préféré sauter. Je suis en bas quand même, pas très loin de la route. Il faut que j'aille jusque-là. Ils ne vont pas me ramasser à deux pas du mur, non? L'endroit et le soir où, où je retrouverai Rolande sont loin encore. Je dois, en je dois d'abord trimballer jusqu'à la route, cette bosse qui m'empêche de marcher. Deux fois... Trois fois, j'essaie de poser le talon. La foudre s'éveille, me traverse la jambe. Puisque les pieds sont inutiles, je vais marcher sur les coudes et les genoux. Je rampe 20 mètres, je me heurte aux broussailles, je reviens aux pierres, essayant de m'orienter. Un autre siècle du coulé, je ne retrouve rien. Ma cheville est scellée, pieds et jambes à angle droit. Je la coltine comme un poids à la verticale. Elle bascule dans la pierraille et la griffe des buissons. La nuit est opaque. Là-haut, tous ces derniers mois, je regardais les fourrés si proches de la grande route et j'étais certaine de pouvoir m'y retrouver les yeux fermés. Mes projets ne passaient pas en encore par là, mais cependant une tentation constante de sauter et de m'enfuir faisait machinalement son chemin. Et tout en souriant au troupeau de filles massées frileusement autour de l'éducatrice, tout en serrant, dans ma poche où elle se glissait, la main de Rolande, 
Je volais au bas des pierres et je me relevais, houhou, narquoise et purifiée. Et nous regagnons les lumières, entraînant les pieds. Je laissais la main de mon ami dans ma poche et je fouillais dans la sienne. Pour découvrir à travers l'étoffe le 1-2 de l'articulation, Rolande, je sens ton eau qui marche. Et nous pouffions sous le manteau, et le pavillon avec son éclairage confisquait les rêves jusqu'au lendemain. Je rampe, mes coudes deviennent terreux, je saigne dans la boue. Les épines me percent au hasard des buissons. J'ai mal, mais il faut continuer à avancer, au moins jusqu'à jusqu ce que cette lumière, là-bas, une maison qui me promet la route. Entre la lumière et moi, il y a un grillage contre lequel je tombe. Je suis bien, là, couché sur le dos, les yeux fermés, les bras lâches. Ils me ramasseront endormi, tant pis. Je paierai ce repos par des soumissions, des douleurs nouvelles. J'avais vers la terre et j'y reste. Peut-être le mur va-t-il suivre ma chute et m'y enfouir. Je suis debout sur la plante des rotules. Je contourne le grillage. Un genou, un coude, un genou, un coude. Ça va, je m'habitue. Je rêve que je recommence, que je prends mon temps. Au lieu de foncer comme une dingue, de commencer à descendre le mur en m'agrippant aux pierres et d'ouvrir les mains dès que mon pied rencontre le vide, je cherche pour mon atterrissage un coin tendre, là où l'herbe pousse épais et élastique. Je dépasse la villa, dont la lampe brille toujours. J'avance tout contre le mur, dans l'herbe du chemin, coude, genou, coude. Voilà la route, luisante, scindée par la bande jaune. Une tente de métal est posée sur le trottoir, publicité pour une marque d'essence. Je m'y accroche, le panneau cliquette. Je vais commencer mon stop ici. Non, Paris dans la direction opposée, traversons. Le premier pas est en fer rouge, le deuxième en gélatine. Je m'affale en travers de la bande jaune. Le premier écraseur est pour moi. Le voilà, c'est un camion. Il va dans mon sens et rapportera à Paris, collé à ses roues, des lambeaux de moi. Je le regarde dans ses gros yeux jaunes. Il vient sur moi. À quelques mètres, le camion bifurque, monte sur l'accotement et stop. J'entends souffler les freins, puis la portière claque et des pas s'approchent. Je reste écrasé les yeux clos. Mademoiselle, les dents me touchent, cherchent, hésitant, inquiets. Je dis, si vous voulez, sortez-moi de la route, tenez-moi, je crois que j'ai une jambe cassée. Le routier me soutient jusqu'au marchepied du camion. Je m'y assois, la cheville ramenée dans l'ombre. Je ne veux pas regarder. Un réverbère tout près éclaire mon pied droit, il est terreux. La boue sèche autour des ongles noirs et monte en gros bracelet jusqu'à mon genou, strié de déchirures où le sang perle doucement. Je me serre dans mon manteau, les poings dans les poches. J'ai rien d'autre sur le corps et je commence à avoir froid. Froid jusqu'au cœur. Vous voulez me donner une cigarette? Le gars sort ses gauloises et me donne du feu. Dans la lumière, je vois son visage, le visage qu'on les routait la nuit. La peau brillante, le poil qui commence à pousser et cette expression fripée et fixe. Qu'est-ce qui vous est arrivé? Je... « Oh, et puis, au point où j'en suis, je ne risque rien. »« Vous connaissez le coin ?»« Je fais le parcours trois fois par semaine, oui. »« Je désigne la traverse, où le phare de la villa est le seul repère dans une boue confuse d'arbres et de murailles. »« Alors, vous savez peut-être ce qu'il y a là-bas »« Euh, oui. »« Et c'est de là ?»« Oui, à l'instant. »« Enfin, il y a une demi-heure, une heure. »« On ne doit pas me chercher encore. »« Je vous en prie, emmenez-moi à Paris. »« Vous n'aurez pas d'ennui, ma parole. »« À Paris ?» Vous me déposez et je me débrouille. » L'homme réfléchit longuement, puis « Je vous dépannerai bien, mais vous comprenez, il y a votre jambe. »« Mais même jusqu'à Paris, monsieur, je ne vous en demande pas plus. Je ne parlerai jamais de vous, quoi qu'il arrive, croyez-moi. »« Je vous crois, mais vous n'empêcherez rien. Ils ont des moyens que nous n'avons pas. J'ai une femme et des gosses. Je ne peux pas. » J'en serre ma cheville à dix doigts et je marque bout contre la cabine pour essayer de me lever. « Bon, alors laissez-moi. » Seulement, je vous demande, ne les prévenez pas au prochain bled. Oubliez cette rencontre, soyez... J'allais dire, soyez bon. Mais soudain, je réalise le ridicule des mots, le goût de cette cigarette qui s'achève et les dix minutes que l'homme m'a donné. Tenez, dit-il, je peux quand même vous faire un truc, c'est de vous stopper une voiture. Un particulier vous prendrait peut-être. Je rencontrerai un boniment. Qu'il fasse ce qu'il veut. Moi, je ne voudrais que m'amputer de cette jambe et dormir, dormir jusqu'à ce qu'elle repousse et m'éveiller en criant dans mon rêve. Récemment, Sine m'écrivait « Ma chérie, j'ai fait un cauchemar. Tu étais tombée très mal de très haut. Tes oreilles saignaient et moi, je ne pouvais rien, rien que pleurer. Au réveil, j'ai pris ta photo et j'ai soupiré de joie parce que ce n'était pas vrai et que j'allais te voir, comme chaque matin, avec ton air de sous-neuf, filant vers les cuisines avec ta grande casserole à lait. 
Ce que nous avons ri en lisant cela avec Roland. Sin, l'ami de l'an passé, qui était encore à projeter de tout plaquer pour moi, alors que déjà je l'aurais oublié, sans l'incessante saison de ses billets compacts et pliés menus qu'une fille neutre et complaisante m'apportait presque chaque jour. Sin, j'étais las de ses certitudes, de ses abandons possessifs, de la trace qu'elle croyait avoir laissée sur moi, de son maternalisme, ma grande, mon tout petit. J'avais connu Sin dans un train. Des hommes et des femmes se partageaient le compartiment en deux blocs bien groupés. Les hommes chantaient, les femmes se taisaient ou bien pleuraient. Je m'étais ramassée contre la vitre, regardant partir Paris dont les contours se brouillaient sous le triple écran de la vitre sale de la pluie et de mes larmes. Faut pas pleurer. Je remontais le moins bruyamment possible le contenu de mon nez, je passais les doigts sous mes yeux et me tournais vers la voie. Une femme d'une trentaine d'années, aux yeux d'olive noire et en chignon brun, était assise à côté de moi et son sourire était aussi agréable que sa voix. Mes larmes tarirent et je la regardais plus nettement, depuis l'écharpe douce jusqu'aux pieds emballés dans des pantoufles. Je me penchais un peu et j'aperçus sous la banquette des escarpins noirs à talons modérés. Une raffinée. Je lui demandais « Longtemps? »« Longtemps fait ou à faire? »« À faire? »« Le reste, ça ne me regarde pas. »« Oh, pourquoi? »« C'est pas un secret? »« En tout, sept ans. »« Tiens, comme moi, il m'en reste cinq. Et vous? » On ne sait jamais ce qui vous reste. Il y a les grâces, la conditionnelle. Ben, dis-je, tout ça, c'est du char. Je pleure, oui, parce que je suis persuadée de quitter Paris pour cinq ans. Voyez, c'est déjà fini, d'ailleurs. Ces hommes qui n'arrêtent pas de chanter aussi. Heureusement qu'ils descendent en cours de route. Nous échangeons nos prénoms, nos âges. Mineur, mais comment, dit Francine. Pardon, majeur, majeur pénal, majeur mental, majeur tout à fait. La preuve, c'est que j'ai attendu deux ans, comme une grande, qu'on va bien m'en coller cinq de mieux. Je suis jeune, mais là où on va, tout le monde est jeune. Je crois que les prisons et écoles sont réservées aux moins de 30 et 35 ans. Dans la matinée, le paysage changea, se pela, s'estompa. Nous montions vers le nord. Vers midi, le train s'arrêta, enfin. J'avais hâte de quitter mes chaussures. Je n'avais pas pensé, moi, à sortir mes pantoufles, et depuis le temps que je traînais les sandales pénales, j'avais perdu l'habitude des talons hauts. « Attachez vos sandalettes. » J'avais entendu cela pendant deux ans, en même temps que ôtez-moi ce noir à vos yeux, filez mettre votre combinaison, nu sous un chandail, non mais c'est propre, je vous assure. Qu'allait-on me crier maintenant? « Voulez-vous un coup de main? » On n'ordonnait plus, on proposait, et les propos chantaient au lieu d'aboyer. Notre troupeau se rassemblait sur le quai, et des femmes souriantes et séraphiques nous aidaient à porter nos valises, nos paquets mal ficelés, nos filets bourrés de choses disparates et toutes indispensables. « Essayons de rester l'une à côté de l'autre, voulez-vous? » dit Francine. Par la suite, d'autres signes, d'autres coïncidences nous rapprochèrent encore. Nous fûmes désignés pour le même groupe et donc visités par la même éducatrice pendant les trois mois d'isolement réglementaire. Nous bavardions par-dessus les murs des cours de promenade individuelles ou à l'occasion des corvées, Vaisselle, ménage que nous faisons également ensemble. Deux par deux, de même groupe, Sine et moi en alternance avec d'autres. Après ce trimestre, nous rejoindrons le groupe. Nous parlions de ce jour avec plus de ferveur que celui de notre libération, trop lointain encore. Nous rêvions à une sorte de vita nuova, à l'oubli du passé dans la clarté et la propreté du groupe, en pavillonné, à mi en somme, des jeunes pensionnaires, des brebis, des cœurs d'anges chantant à l'unisson. Sine, pourquoi fallut-il qu'à ces projets bienheureux succédât une réalité maudite? Au lieu de me laisser faire tranquillement ma petite chimie, pourquoi as-tu voulu t'en éclabousser? Je faisais des paris, des essais, des croix, parce que je n'avais pas grand-chose pour passer ma jeunesse et mon ennui. Tu le savais, nous nous en rions ensemble, penchés le soir à la fenêtre de nos chambres sans barreaux. Il était défendu de dire « nos cellules ». Tu me grondais parfois, et puis... « Toi dont j'aimais l'amitié, tu as voulu m'encombrer de ton amour. Tu as cru que toi, tu pouvais me greffer des sentiments, me coudre un bout de ton cœur. » Enfin, Sin dormait là-haut, et son rêve prenait corps. Quelque chose comme mes oreilles chéries saignait à mort, mourait longuement, là, au bord de la route où plus jamais je ne me promènerai avec toi, Sin, ou avec Roland ou avec une autre, parce que je ne marcherai plus. À la manière dont je m'étais assise sur le marchepied du camion, je ne pouvais imaginer d'autre suite que l'allongement, l'immobilité définitive. 
Il y a guerre de bagnole à cette heure-ci, dit le routier en revenant. Ça va? C'est pas pire que tout à l'heure. Partez. Allez, je vous ai déjà bien assez retardé. De toute façon, on ne va pas tarder à venir me chercher. Un bruit de moteur surgit du fond de la nuit. Le gars s'élança. Je voyais sa silhouette, découpée par l'effort, faisant de grands gestes. Ce que les voitures vont vite maintenant. Il va se faire écrabouiller. Je me reculais dans l'ombre et la cabine et je fermais les yeux. La voiture s'était arrêtée. Une portière claqua. Des pas et des voix s'approchèrent. Le regard filtrant, j'aperçus un homme immobile devant le routier qui lui parlait, désignait le rempart, puis moi. L'homme tournait le dos au réverbère et faisait une ombre précise, tassée, mais enfoncée dans les poches et col relevé. Bien qu'il parlasse tout près de moi, je n'entendais presque rien. Un brouillard épais comme du coton et translucide comme du verre me séparait d'eux et je m'y enfonçais de plus en plus, comme en un sommeil. « Montrez un peu ce pied, » dit la silhouette. Mon genou engourdi n'en finissait plus de ramener ma jambe de dessous le marchepied. Je l'aidais en tirant à deux mains sur le mollet. Puis, machinalement, j'ai pris appui sur le talon pour me lever. Et ce que je ressentis alors fut si atroce, si désespérant, que j'abandonnais et laissais mon pied retomber dans l'ombre et dans la boue. L'homme s'accroupit devant moi et promena le faisceau d'une lampe de poche. Je voyais le blond lisse de ses cheveux, l'ocre rose de son oreille et de sa main. Il se redressa éteignit la lampe et s'éloigna vers sa voiture avec le routier. Qu'il s'en aille, ça m'était égal. À nouveau, j'avais cessé d'entendre et de m'intéresser. Ensuite, tout se passa très vite. Un bras entourant mes épaules, un autre se glissa sous mes genoux, je fus soulevé, emporté. Le visage de l'homme de tout à l'heure était tout proche, au-dessus du mien, avançant à travers le ciel et les branches des arbres. Il me portait avec sûreté et douceur. J'avais quitté la voue et je marchais dans ses bras, entre ciel et terre. L'homme s'engagea dans un chemin de traverse, fit encore quelques mètres, puis me déposa par terre avec précaution. M'habituant à l'obscurité, je distinguais un gros arbre, de l'herbe, des flaques. « Affranchi personne et surtout ne bouge pas », dit l'homme avant de se relever. « Je vais venir te chercher. Attends-moi. Attends-moi tout le temps qu'il faudra. » Et il s'éloigna. Un peu après, j'entendis les moteurs du camion et de la voiture. Des lumières glissèrent, puis tout redevint silence, désert, nuit. Je ne bougeais pas. Tout à l'heure, si j'avais moins mal, je me rapprocherais un peu de la route. J'étais trop enfoncé dans cette traverse. L'homme ne pourrait pas me retrouver. Je referais en sens inverse quelques mètres, quelques arbres. J'avais le temps. Je savais que la première ville était à 40 km. 40 plus 40. Il y avait du monde dans la voiture. J'avais entendu parler. Peut-être que l'homme... Peut-être l'homme voulait-il déposer ses passagers avant de revenir. Affranchi personne. Je souriais, la bouche contre les racines de l'arbre. Maintenant, j'étais complètement allongée. Je trempais dans l'herbe. Je me glaçais peu à peu. À l'autre bout de moi, ma cheville menait, chaque... menait grand tapage, fondée en rigole incandescente à chaque pulsation de mon cœur. J'avais un nouveau cœur dans la jambe, mal rythmé encore, répondant désordonnément à l'autre. Là-haut, les branches noires étaient figées dans la glace du ciel. Sur la route, des voitures passaient et s'éloignaient. Aucune ne ralentissait. Aucune ne tournait vers moi. Il fallait bien que l'homme revînt, car je n'avais plus la force d'aller chercher une autre chance. Et on ne devait pas me retrouver là au matin. Pour ma jambe, je ne me faisais aucun souci. Elle serait soignée de toute façon. Déjà, la douleur s'était familiarisée. Elle se promenait dans mon corps, visitant chaque recoin et l'engourdissant au passage. Elle s'étalait et s'aplanissait. Seule, par-ci, par-là, de petites flamèches surprenantes me faisaient sursauter et m'empêchaient de m'endormir tout à fait. Je triturais dans ma poche le mégot de la gauloise que le routier m'avait donné. Ce serait peut-être mon seul trophée. Ce n'était pas si mal au fond. J'avais une clope, une vraie grande clope de gauloise, et j'étais libre de la jeter ou de l'émietter. J'avais laissé là-haut mon papier à rouler mes allumettes. Rolande, Rolande, j'ai un beau mégot et je ne peux pas le fumer. Une allumette traçante, une étoile filante, un anti-brouillard. Non, c'est la forge de ma cheville qui illumine toute la traverse. Les lancers tourbillonnent un moment, puis se rassemblent et s'immobilisent en un rond de lumière miroitante. Une grosse torche dont le faisceau passe au ras de ma tête et se fixe sans m'avoir touché dans le tronc de l'arbre. Il me semble aussi qu'un bruit de moteur bref et mourant a gonflé la nuit, mais j'ai dû rêver. Le foie seul crisse dans mes oreilles. Pourtant, le phare est toujours là. Je peux détailler l'écorce de l'arbre. Et voici qu'une deuxième lumière s'allume, minuscule et remuant, 
qui fouille rapidement, tout près du sol. Ça y est, je suis découverte. Tout s'éteint et quelqu'un se rapproche. C'est lui, sûr. Je t'avais pourtant dit de ne pas bouger. Ah, j'ai bougé? C'est possible. Tout redevient possible. Je crois que je ris, que j'entoure le cours de l'homme, que oui, oui, fait-il, en se dégageant pour chercher dans sa poche intérieure de son blouson. Il en sort un flacon plat, un paquet de cigarettes. On a tout le temps maintenant. Nous buvons un tour de rôle au goulot. À chaque bouchée, l'infime brasé de nos cigarettes tire nos visages de l'obscurité. Vider ce paquet et cette bouteille, et après, qu'importe, j'ai retrouvé toute espérance. L'homme continue à sortir des choses. Tu sais, j'ai apporté un pantalon, un pull, il y a aussi une bande velpo. C'est vrai, je suis presque à poil. Je retire le manteau, j'enfile le chandail, mais le pantalon... Comment entrer dans une jambe de pantalon avec ce pied soufflé qui ne cambre plus, qui éclate en douleur au moindre frôlement? Je remets le manteau et je dis, comment t'appelles-tu? Maintenant, nous sommes deux prénoms. Nous allons quitter ensemble les arbres noirs et au matin, nous apprendrons le reste. Partir d'abord, vite. Tu ne veux pas essayer de mettre au moins la bande? Il gèle, tu sais. Oh non, n'y touchons pas, par pitié. Je resterai pieds nus, ça ne fait rien. Comme tu veux. Je vais te porter sur la moto. Tiens-toi à moi. Tu préviens si ça ne va pas. Tu sais aller à moto? Oui, j'avais l'habitude, t'en fais pas. Partons maintenant. Je me recroqueville tout autour de la flamme figée que l'alcool a dessinée en moi. Je laisse mon pied pendre à côté de la roue et je manque à deux bras aux épaules de Julien. Un autre siècle commence. Next, we have Christina Akkar. I'm going to be reading Anna Opperman, Ensembles from 1968 to 1992, and the chapter is called Facing the Others by Anne Lorek. In her ensembles, Anna Opperman lets others speak for her, yet she also permits the ensembles to speak for her, the author, because she stages a kind of advocacy that corresponds far less with a plea than it does with addressing a claim to someone, with something that addresses her, slash me, because it claims something from her, slash me, and demands notice. Advocacy and addressing thus imply an authority. It is for this reason only that advocacy can be sustained and claims can lapse. This is precisely where change is possible. If we understand the act of speaking for oneself as the antithesis of any act of supposedly autonomous art artistic subjectivity, then the emphasis of advocacy is not on the ego, an exclusive for oneself, but on a speech act that is distinguished by the way it determines another subject, the one who listens. This concept of discourse deals with the social bond. It signals the symbolic form in which the unconscious is manifested in society, beyond the individual speaking, being, and beyond the imaginary individual and collective desire. An appeal is issued by Anna Opperman's ensemble titles, which themselves appear to imply the really urgent questions. Can you hear me? Can you understand me? Their unruly form, brief theses, provocative observations, and precarious imperatives excites dialogue and examination. The position of the subject is negotiable within the discourse. It is geared to or limited by it. Here, responsibility ultimately comes into play, since in advocacy or addressing someone, it is necessary to represent someone, intervene on behalf of someone or something, be someone's advocate, and speak in someone else's name. Or, as the brothers Grimm noted in their Dictionary of the German Language, which although antiquated still applies after more than a century, advocacy is antecedent speech. As we can see, it is about announcing something to be repeated verbally, above all. However, 
to announce something verbally that will be written down later, yet there's a foreseeable danger, and Opperman not only recognizes it, she also turned it into one of her themes. What has been written down later can, in no time at all, become a dictate. This kind of speech can turn into an act of subordination, just as any kind of image can threaten to suddenly transform into a tyrannical exemplar. Because this relationship in and with language, in and with the image, had and still has consequences for the woman and the artist. Long before the citationality of gender attempted to articulate the continuous and powerful reproduction of a kind of dual genderedness becoming a cultural standard in the process, Anna Opperman essentially cites within the framework of gender difference. So whereas she herself transcribed and traced ironically and reverently within the context of this predictable imperative, which affects psychical and social life, she speaks of repeated conformity and subordination under the visual realm, hence the multi-focused perspective and lack of spatial coherence. The visual status of women, hence for one, the awkward placement, where sitting, standing or reclining, and for another, the cliches of femininity, the, class, the classic, especially Gothe, and so forth. For it seems as if for her, language must have been one of the uppermost authorities, one of the most violent as well as seductive. Jack Lacan articulated its effect on people in such a way that it makes plain the trouble with the gradual subordination to people to gender. A structure, namely the language, carves up his, being the human being's body, a structure that has nothing to do with anatomy. Thus, Opperman was not ambivalent in her encounter with anatomy. She devoted herself to the anatomy of plants. She primarily and justifiably encountered the excerpts she herself selected with programmatic ambivalence. I hate final formulations, absolute gestures. Quote within the ensemble should not, for instance, be accepted as complete interpretations. Since there is a fractured relationship to verbal articulation, I can be just as surprised by a word or a quote as would be by a found object that attracted my visual interest. At least one quote is specified by the artist, despite or due to her doubt in the authority of the quote as the basis for each one of the arrangements, while for others it serves as a communication aid. Even when she began specifying what citations are for, for her, Opperman had placed the familiar and the other in a paradoxical relationship. Among the components of a 1977 ensemble, quotes by myself and others, banal utterances and quotes from the fields of psychology, sociology, and philosophy. From these fields of knowledge emerges a fundamental claim addressed to the modern subject. Concentrated within them are the power based in knowledge above the soul, about society. Their apparatus is in charge of determining the difference between pathology and normality. Competing within philosophy as the representative of an old notion of truth, two of the so-called politically liberating sciences of what was known as the 1968 generation may be identified. Opperman, not least due to her perspective as a woman, seems to have, seems to have been skeptical about their general liberating character for society. Not too long before that, in his 1968 book, The Order of Things, Michel Foucault has, had problem, problematized the human sciences, to which he counted psychology and sociology. Because of the positivity and empirics of their investigative mode, in which the human being is supposedly at one and the same time both subject and object of his awareness. The human being is, therefore, not at the center of the ensemble, Opperman declared in 1975 in Schema der Method, means scheme of the method. It might have been the conclusion she drew from the irreconcilability of human scientific research and the discourse as knowledge of the unconscious. It was out of this dilemma that she built her ensembles. No exposition of sources or methods can ever be remain exclusively factual and operative. If one wants to object to institutions, the material has to reveal its relationship to the person who has selected it 
and not least of all to her odd desire, which is far more intense than any sort of so-called pure interest in the object. Just like the hair combed in the front of the face in Undershine, being different, begun in 1970, the citation as masquerade might achieve the simultaneous expression of two sides of a difference. Ultimately, Opperman looked for quotes that correspond to personal views, reinforce them, contradict them, and those that are grotesque simplifications, brutal and dangerous, examples taken from advertising and the press, whose effects ought to be analyzed. This kind of entanglement of self and others into the judgmental readings is complex from the start, even complicated, since repetition is enfolded within it. To this extent, citation is revealed as the kind of social and cultural practice that molds an individual, because it has power over the individual. Yet, although one is always being called or sent for, even by the citations themselves, there is always room to participate in the, in the familiar mechanism of exchange and recognition citation involves. In this way, Opperman created a relationship between subjectivity, authorship, and authority. In her own masquerades, she renders her own face vulnerable by making the citations anonymous. She does the same thing with the faces of the others, although not all of them. Since those we call the famous retain their names, their authority is strengthened to such an extent that we encounter it with a certain astonishment, skepticism, and the desire to contradict it. That is why the artist, starting with the together of the ensemble, which is the French meaning of the word, define her work through others as a collaborative effort with them. However, the person who works through others is in danger of passing over the work of these others because he implies his standards from the outside. Yet, in the entanglement of the voices with the with of the collaboration, the through is revealed as something that is also for me, acts on my behalf, directed towards me and replaces me. Thus, in a surprising way, something returns to the subject and figures, it, and, and figures its autobiography. In order to be able to enjoy this kind of encouragement, this kind of, of advocacy, one cannot unlearn the language of others, especially since outside the connection to the others, via the bond that constitutes society in the first place, it makes another great promise, namely to compensate for a lack. Reflection analysis and becoming aware of problems require the integration of further levels of expression. As I came from the image, those levels basically belong to the realm of language. In the beginning was the image, not the word, according to Opperman's biographical speech. And in her eyes, the origin remains somewhat to blame. At this point, at least, the artist reproduced the traditionally asymmetrical relationship between the image and the techniques of the logos, for her image has traits of the feminine and the other. Is it so that this is precisely what has to be delegated to the language of the others, so that, as the feminine subject, it is not lost to the bond? Besides an individual situation, a historical situation in cultural practices is also described where semiology is implemented as hegemonial pattern of interpretation. Considering the current emphasis on visual affirmation and the dictates of the nom dominant notion of a so-called visual culture, an important question would be if Opperman would have appealed in a similar way to the authority of language in order to create something whose unmistakable and specific features were measured in turn, at least in the 1980s, by interpreters who used linguistic means. Anna Opperman has created possibility in her visual art that usually only occur in language, also in the way she provides references to time and reality. Today, it will perhaps not take us any further to recall the debate concerning the visual status of women, which feminist film and art history first brought to attention and whose theoretical development took place at the same time Opperman was producing art. Polemically speaking, meaning in that mode the artist understandably wanted to avoid since it is an expressive form used by the authorities, 
it is no longer considered the opportune moment to include this issue of the visual status of women as a critical aspect in the analysis of representations of gender ever since a kind of hegemonial visual science sees hold of the image in general without regarding to questions of gender difference. And when today, from a feminist perspective, it is pointed out that Opperman kept a low profile with regard to her gender, then it is already assumed that there is a current position possible, a position beyond the most recent kind of visibility decreed by identity politics, as well as beyond the older, of I the older idea of the visual status of women. It seems to me that, in terms of gender, the artists worked on the symbolic position where there can be no obviousness, but only relationality. In this respect, the selection and assessments of her methods and her theme or keywords, and how Opperman systematically rank, rank them first in most of her ensembles is a topic for critical discussion against a historical background. Even the method she conceived and practiced as communication turned out to be an obstacle to reception, for after all, efforts to communicate are considered feminine. Things do not get easier if we consider that Opperman played with the programmatic notion of the genius, positioning herself among the ranks of the outsiders, the odds one out. Even when she turned her process explicitly against the genius, traditionally connoting male, there remains a dilemma involving an unclear proximity, for art does not acknowledge either an ironic or a female genius, although it knows the crazy woman. Often enough, the Opperman, often enough, Opperman was not held to be a genius, but simply dismissed as a neurotic person, someone who is disturbed, psychotic, egomaniacal, just totally crazy, incapable of drawing conclusions and creating context. The defensive gesture of the art system is obvious. Today, Considering everything that we have been able to find out about Opperman's work from a certain temporal distance and through historical altered cultural and aesthetic aspects, it is clear that independent of any sort of psychobiographical truth, highly conventional ideas of female and male subjectivity are inscribed in many of the older opinions. And here, we once again run into what Opperman called into question the brutal and dangerous traits of some citations and their authorities, which she saw not only in the press and advertising, but in art as well. For art criticism is also a form of advertising, while a certain unintentional image gives rise to a well-meaning yet equally limiting assignment to the role of female artist, consequently resulting in her slash a gender position. In the foreword of the catalogue for what was then the most comprehensive exhibition of Opperman's oeuvre at the Kunstverein in Hamburg in 1984, her work is poetically yet problematically referred to as a sweeping papai theater, meaning toy theater, of mental obsessions. The paper used in toy theaters is considered fragile and during its development in the early 19th century, the Biedermeier period in Germany, Papai theater was a, time, was a type of domestic entertainment known as the little theater form or children's theater. On these kinds of stages, which are small format in various respects, salvation is only promised by the spiritual quality of obsessions. It is not, for example, mere neurosis, the hysterical symptom, which is presented in the light construct of materials and metaphors that make up the ensemble, a structure that can be jumbled up at any time by the wind or other disturbances. Instead, it is something spiritual, which has been defined in the history of subjectivity as male and heroic. A good 20 years ago, past the difference in concepts of gender that also influenced the practices of museum, this is the only way that the delicate, fragile Papai theater could ripen into art fit for the museum. This kind of latent, but by no means impotent discussion of the gender of the artist can be attributed to the institution's unconscious and is therefore spoken about the artist rather than with her.
According to Opperman's advice, one might draw conclusions not from what is communicated, but from what is omitted. So besides the citation as masquerade, right in the midst of all that is copied, noted, torn out, drawn, photographed, and constructed, in all of this abundance, there are more staged gaps, and these concern a certain kind of mimicry. In the gesture of the open-ended method in particular, there's an exaggerated yet, yet simultaneously provisional misrepresentation of the image that the subject has, or does not have, of itself, subordinate to the dictates of expectations and authority of those images that science, culture, and advertising have already provided for a woman and an artist. In short, subordinate the discourse. Since Opperman used her method as the means to ultimately and abstractly blend herself as a self-image, a performer, into an ensemble of on different representational levels, this kind of mimicry can be considered a stricter test for of the gender position. This is why Jacques Lacan also most clearly perceived the gender position slash opposition wherever sexual attraction is set off in the disguises known as masculine and feminine. For this, this precarious body, although positioned in the gender scheme by the masquerade, twists and turns back and forth, always having at least two sides. Of these, proverb sorry. of these proverbial two sides, only one usually reflects what is thought to be a view in the dual meaning of the word. The visible side, which is then considered advantageous when it reflects what, what corresponds to the general view of gender and sexuality. So it is then possible to discern or even acknowledge an absurd face made up with round, red dots, German name, the economic aspect, begun in 1978 as a female author slash subject, a fragment among many, a spot in the enormously big picture. If yes, then not as this kind of masked figure, but simply in the mirror, all of the voices, images, and objects called up while they themselves, like splinters of a mirror, already embody what is the fragile imaginary. In Opperman's work, this is more than a simple hysteric and thus fundamentally fragile experience of constructing the self through the function of the imaginary. For the protagonists in most of the ensembles, friends, gallerists, all the artists, are male, guaranteeing that the reflection function supplies a view of the mask that is not exclusively, but mostly, male. Opperman ultimately calls into a question female figures, not just as mother and Mary, between pregnancy and mystery, that is reinforced by the critical function of the cliché, but also in relation to admiration. However, admiration is among those tasks that delineate the difference between oneself and the other by means of a very thin line. To allow oneself to be admired and to admire something else, oneself are two sides of the same reflection. The method itself is still in its spatial physical center with the element of the altar as the site of worship, indebted to an authority defined as male in Western Christian culture that extends to patriarchal line to God, the Father, or derives it from him, embraces and attacks it, sanctifies it, or profanes it. Above all, it is repetition that counts. Without it, knowledge cannot be knowledge, cannot be established as such. On the other hand, especially in the dramatic process of the mise en abîme, it mutates into the absolute deconstruction of knowledge. Opperman begins this revocation, achieved through the sheer endless doubling of placement and hierarchical categorization with the methodological rule that every ensemble must contain a photo of the elaborate process of constructing an ensemble. Still, it does not remain in this state since on the next level it is recorded, once again added to the ensemble, recorded and so on, achieving an optical reverie in its dizzying condensation. Nothing that does not undergo the process of being removed in continually paler copies or as an already hoarse echo 
further and further from the authority of the source can do better at breaking the power of knowledge, a power that, in contradiction to its genesis, is based in the source, not on iteration. However, knowledge is not everything, and Opperman does not organize it in the ensembles as if it were. Ultimately, this sort of almost exaggerated subjugation is bound up with a superfluity of desire beneath a deliberately fragmented, heterogeneous knowledge. Thus, it remains impossible to decide if the material and metaphorical categorizing of friends, characters, authors, objects, data, words, information, etc., can be attributed to the organization of knowledge or the confusion of desire. It is this kind of relation of insecurity of which we mainly know that a relationship between oneself and others will be effective, that Lacan says distinguishes the discourse of the hysteric. In the wake of the political movements of 1968, Lacan developed this discourse as one of four. Each of these discourses describes a different dominant structure in a formal way, simultaneously imitating and contradicting the scientific gesture. The organization of the discourse on the hysteric begins within the subject, which appears as the authority or the agent. Even though it refers to the others, it does so with the goal of dominating it in a paradoxical way, for the subject has to be represented by its knowledge, although not without suffering the, the fact that no knowledge will ever be complete and sufficient for it. If we refer to this discourse in order to interpret, I'm sorry, if we refer to this discourse in order to interpret Opperman's works, we do so primarily to go beyond the pathological structure of hysteria, which, as is known, was often applied to the artist to examine the problem of gender positioning within the social group as something figured by the discourse. In this sense, it should be repeated that Opperman's crucial demand of herself to unlearn, not unlearn the language of others, is not so much an individual way of mentally begging to be allowed to participate, to be recognized, rather it resembles intersubjectivity itself with all of its dominant simplifications, including the gender hierarchy. The question Lacan used to characterize the hysterical gender position as the female gender position, what is it to be a, a woman? Both the female and male hysteric ponder still suggest that an answer is possible. It seems as if Opperman turned away from hysterical hesitation concerning that question, which is always speaking itself and through which the female hysteric speaks. To translate the hierarchical relations that describes the discourse into components of dialogue. Typically enough, early ensembles are called Hausfrau Schein, meaning being a housewife, which began in 1968, and Frauen wie Angel, which means women like angels, a word play combining the word Angel, angels, and Erger, anger, the comparison being that women are like angels and are angry as well, and it began in 1969. In contrast to the hysteria, this qualifying slash qualifying question of femininity, Opperman put parentheses around Frauschein, meaning being a woman, and placed it behind cucumbers and tomatoes in her ensemble, Gurken und Tomaten, Frauschein. Decoratively arranged on a kitchen table, cucumber slices and tomato halves become a beautiful but sorry effort an alter to the everyday cut to size kinds of gender. It needs to be, it needs to be kept fresh in its complementary. I'm very sorry. It needs to be kept fresh in its complementarities, green and red. And in an ironic overdrawing, it remains undecided if this is the task of the house housewife, or if the housewife is the effect of this kind of social arrangement. In the alliteration of Arger, anger, and Engel, angel, in the gap between what is subjectively experienced and the mythopoetic ideal, Frauen wie Engel transports an image of women that is experienced both as angry and socially effective. The fact that, among other things, a linguistic rhetorical trick is once again expressed here 
makes the representation of the language of others effective in point of a literary, aesthetic interpretation of difference, whose target is also, but in no way only, gender difference. Surely this occurred in a deliberately temp temporary material and medially reduced way, always with the reservation that the next edition would come and produce even more versions. For how else can one critically deal with power, including the power to define what and how a woman is and has to be? Above all, however the possible dominance of knowledge seems to be broken when a methodically applied lack of understanding and ironic admiration exposed the already sexualized obedience of understanding and conformity. As the discourse on the hysteric articulates, the subject dominates upper men's process and aesthetic. It acts as Anna Opperman, yet it is precisely the certain, sometimes almost aggressive presumption involved in the incorporation of the works, metaphors, and visual images of the others that, like an obstinate way of occupying spaces as far as the surreal dimension of the mise en abîme, intransigently transfers each ontology and most especially hysterical femininity to relations of power to different bodies of listeners and viewers.